can't get that open, um, just copy the link for the Toadplex Dungeon Toadplex video. It's like a little too it very concisely describes why invasive weeds are invasive. <laughs> so I thought it would be a good, like, if we can run the little video, it'd be a good little. Yeah. You're yeah. asking for miracles. <laughs> well, you don't get them if you don't ask. Uh, I'll be back. So do you report on Coco Rose? Hmm? Do you report on Coco Rose? Mm -hmm. What's that? So it's a community collaborative rain hail snow network. Oh. And it's a community science-based program. So citizen science. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so like I've got changes in the fine house or something. Like right. That. Yeah. But, you know, I just got one hundred of an inch of rain or whatever out of snow. So <clears throat> So it goes. Oh, we do not like touch pads. No, we don't need any. Here's the Laramie County. This is a quiet day. <laughs> yes, other than wind, not much happened. Not much happened. Normally, this is there's a lot more people reporting. This is me. Yeah, Wanda reports. Wanda's right out here. <laughs> Yeah. So it's kind of cool. Nice. I didn't absolutely really want aware of that website. That's cool. Yep. I'll have to go check that out. Is that something that your kiddo could do? <laughs> Maybe not quite. <laughs> she can push play on a YouTube video, but that's, <laughs> that's the level we're at, right? That's funny. Nice. 
Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to class. Tonight's guest speaker is Kim Parker, and Kim is a master gardener from way back like 20, 2004. 2004. And she's almost 20 years now. Yeah. Oh, I know. <laughs> I know. I still look the same as I did then. That's what master gardenerism does to you. So I like that song. Yeah. <laughs> Um, 30 years ago. I know. <laughs> Why didn't I start? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's just like my hair isn't turning gray. <laughs> it's the lights. It's, it's the light. Yeah, it's the light. Um, <laughs> Kim, Kim has been teaching perennials and annuals for about 10 years now. A little longer. Uh, the first one was 2009. 2009. Yeah. So that's kind of an important part of being part of the master gardener group is that you know you you special you eventually specialize in something or try to or not. Or she reels you in on something. Yeah, or I reel you in on something. And and Kim's specialty for tonight is with um, perennials and house. And I got twisted her arm on house plants because she is amazing with house plants. I have a brown thumb. I have I have four cats in the house, so <laughs> yeah, cats can be challenging. Cats sure. can be challenging. I I do want to do just a little kind of plug for Coco Ross in case you guys aren't familiar with it. Or is anyone in? Oh, you're fine. Is anyone reporting for Coco Ross, which is community supported collaborative rain hail and snow network? So why aren't you up there? There's someone in here before me playing with the equipment. Oh, oh I hate that. He promised me he didn't do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Athletic director. Could it just be the camera? Uh, your, your phone? It's on the side. You can move it one way or the other off your screen, and it'll show up on that one. Yeah, but I want one on one. and. One or the other. She has particular desires. Yeah, I do. I'm gonna, Kim, I'm going to put. Machine, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> one for everybody, or yeah, just one? Pass. yeah, if you want one. Anyway, as soon as I can get this up on the screen, I'm sure up on the screen. You're all plugged in. So this is uniquely different tonight. So anyway, this is just a quick plug. I I'm not part of the organization other than I do report for Coco Raz. And for the life of me, I don't know quite how I did what I did, but yeah. This this Happy makes accident. Makes no sense to me. I'm going to go grab my coworker. But anyway, all those little dots on there are citizens that have reported the amount of rain or snow that they've received. And so, and that's really all it is it's just rain reporting or moisture reporting. I have a gay, I have a, a rain or snow collection tube, and I melt the snow in there. I measure how much moisture is out of that. Thank you. I'm a mind reader. No, I have no idea. <laughs> I have no idea. There was a guy in here before me, and he promised me he didn't mess up with my equipment. <laughs> so it's just set up as separate um, monitors. So how do you want it? Well, I want I want my here's my mouse. I want my PowerPoint on on there, and I want my Zoom. So that I can manage Zoom. Do 
So you have three screens. This is one, two, and three. Let's do this. So this is this screen, this one is this one, that one's that one. Oh, yeah. That was your fair point. So before you leave, do you guys have a pointer or an answer for that? PowerPoint? Other than the keypad? I can get you one. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Then she can um, use the, so, the laptop. So we yeah. have multiple screens. You have to just specify here and tell it uh, three. I think maybe it was up here. Do that right? No. No, I think three is that one. Yeah. Now we just need to put zoom on the on the other monitor. And this, then that way I can share this tool. Yeah, Thank you. And I'll go find a uh I can also use the keypad if we can. Yeah, the, the problem with the pointers is that they have a tendency to get accidentally taken. Yes, I imagine that would be an issue. Okay, so I'm gonna share the PowerPoint screen with you all. And So everybody that's on Zoom, can you see the PowerPoint? Okay. Yes. I have no idea why it's so washed out. But maybe we need to dim the lights. Can we do that in here? Mm -hmm. Yep. So am I looking at this one or that one? Is that one? This one. Time? Well, this one won't move. Okay. This one will show you what they're seeing and what's up next. Okay. Okay. Can we back it up just a tiny, yep. tiny bit? One side. Yep. You ready to go? Well, that's why when you said. When you have those you're like, oh, you're running out of places to put things. <laughs> a lot of times you have to start this slideshow after you put this in, or it doesn't work. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, hey, that looks like it works. <laughs> Oh, you your your screen share wrong. Right. Yeah. You want to screen share screen two. Okay, there we go. That'll work. Please press that by which screen you're sharing. It's still there. It's just. So she just needs to see all the Zoom people, right? That's right. As long as I can see the Zoom, and the Zoom. I'll use that screen to view my next slide. Yep. Yeah, okay. 
And then if you do that, you have that. I don't know why that's not there. Yeah. Yeah. You just have to highlight over it. That's okay. Okay. All right. So is there a best place for me to stand for? So I so I'm not in people's way on the your yes. home screens. Yeah, you're not. Okay. You're they're fine. seeing this and where you are. They have a second camera. Yep. So excellent. So what I what I normally do is I just I just learned in 2021. Is stand here. Oh, I can tell you from watching online, if you use this, the camera will pick it up depending upon what Catherine's doing, because the camera will move around. Okay. And anywhere in this area, the camera will pick you up, but it's sharing the screen okay. no matter what. All right. So there's a little x ray here on the cover. <laughs> all righty. Well, I think we have all the technical issues straightened out finally. Welcome. This is kind of a fun class. Um, it is a very open format. So if you have a question, you can either keep it until I pause for breath, or you can just kind of say, hey, what about, and, and ask, and we can have a little discussion about it. So um, we do want to try to have you out here by nine o'clock. So <laughs> I will do my very best to get that done. <laughs> um, I, I routinely give presentations that are two or three hours long. So it's usually not a problem for me talking, especially if you're excited, I get excited. Usually Catherine's like, I have to go feed my sheep. <laughs> Come on, let's go. <laughs> okay, let's try this pointer out. Doesn't really wanna move, does it? This. Okay. Try it. That's too bad. There we go. Okay. The cursor was on this side. Oh, yeah. And it needed to be over there. Okay. So, so, so I wanted to show you um, if any of you get an email from me, this is also my email picture thing. Um, this is kind of where I got started, or one of the places I got started with my plants. Just a little bit about me for background. Um, I grew up in a big gardening family. My grandmother had a huge, massive garden, um, fed her family with it throughout the years, and kind of taught me love of gardening. I wish I had the garden that she does, but um, I live in town. And um, then also, when I was uh, just out of college, I started working for the Forest Service, and my first job was to follow cows around and determine how much of plants they, have eat, they had eaten. So I got to look at stubble that was about this big, and I had to try to figure out what it had been to start with, how big it should have been to start with, and how what it was. So... I kind of learned to botanize the hard way, <laughs> kind of like reverse. <laughs> What's left and what would it have been? So that's kind of where I got my start in um, with plants. Um, this is my little girl before I had to give her a haircut. And um, she's 15 now, she'll be turning 15 in a month. She's a special needs child. Um, so a lot of the things I talked to you about tonight are gonna be pretty much no nonsense. I don't like fiddly plants. If they can't look gorgeous without me, they're not likely to be in my garden. <laughs> so that's just kind of my gardening philosophy is uh, I, I've got plenty of other things to do with my time. <laughs> I don't need high maintenance plants. And then I like to recreate in teepees. So what I'd like to do for you today is to go through um, basically, uh, some of the challenges we face growing things here in Cheyenne, raise your hands for me. Who's, who's native to Cheyenne or have you all just moved here recently? Okay. So a couple of you have been here and know the climate. How many of you are from someplace else and you're trying to figure out how to grow stuff here? All right. <laughs> That's perfect. We've, we've got, we've got some good things for you. 
Um, and then also um, to introduce you to some low maintenance, high performing perennials, my speed. And also really like to give you ideas for how you can increase the pollinators in your gardens, because it's all about that web of pollinators and plants. Um, and I have a degree in ecology, so it kind of falls into that for me also. Um, and then also give you some gardening tips and tricks. I am by no means an expert. Like I said, I started with native plants. I'm still learning ornamentals. So and then we have the itty bitty bit on um, house plants. The house plant starts you see in front of you are well rooted and need to find homes. Um, the more you take home, the fewer I have to pot up and put in planters and sell at the plant sale. <laughs> so help me out. <laughs> Even if you know a neighbor that might want one, take some with you. Okay. All right, let's talk a little bit about the USDA hardiness zones. I'm sure Catherine has already introduced this topic to you, but just kind of as an overview, we are in zone 5B, we're in zone 4, the coldest of the two zone 5s, but pretend like we're in a zone 4, because every five years or so we get a zone 4 winter, and guess what? So if you don't have your little zone five plant protected pretty well, you won't have it anymore, especially with your perennials. Unless you know you're gonna be planting it in a protected spot, you always wanna use zone four or higher, or lower, sorry. Um, and the one thing I like to show this map is it's, you can see those bands of color pretty much match the latitude, okay? The further north you are, the lower your zone. Now, we live in a state where topography gets involved, okay? So this is kind of a zoom in of the Wyoming zone map. And I think I have a web link of that in my web link documents for you. So you can see that. But you can see when you have mountains, the zones go down also, okay? So elevation is also a key contributor to zone. Um, so what they use to develop the, the USDA hardiness zones is the period of time between 1976 and 2005. They update that about every 10 years. Um, like I said, the last time they updated it, they bumped us up into the coldest of the two zone fives. But who knows where it's going the next time they do it, another 10 years or five years or something. Um, but uh, zone B, I guess, sorry. I should read my own slide. <clears throat> yeah, so that means that the coldest weather that we experience in an average year is minus 10 to minus 15. What was our coldest in 2022? Ding, 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 ding. <laughs> it was your zone for winter. <laughs> okay, so that pretty much proves the point right there. So the other thing I mentioned before is, is microclimates. And that's just means, do you have a south facing place where it's up against the foundation maybe, and there's some residual heat held by the foundation. The sun can shine on it all, all winter long. Maybe it's protected from the wind or the snow doesn't drift there, or maybe the snow does drift there. So it insulates the plants. There's a lot of different things that can feed into that microclimate. You might have a pocket of clay soil that grows certain plants better than the sandy soil that's right next to it. That all makes a huge difference to plants. And then also, if you start layering multiple stressors onto a plant. So in other words, if you have a zone five plant and it's in a perfectly happy little spot, no trouble. But if all of a sudden you start adding things like rapidly fluctuating daytime temperatures. It's 45 and sunny in the day, and it drops down to 20 at night. That's hard for a perennial plant. Um, maybe it gets um, not enough water for it, or something like that. There's another stressor in there that could actually cause it to underperform, if you will, and you'll lose it even though it's in a happy place, should be a happy place for it. Um, in general, I try to plant zone four stuff, but that doesn't stop me from trying 
<laughs> to plant zone five stuff. So what I do is I try to say, mm -hmm, where would it be happy? Where could I put that? And if it dies, I'll say, hmm, I'll try again. If it dies a second time, <laughs> yeah. I'm moving on. <laughs> okay. All right. And it also depends on how badly I want to plant that said plant. Still trying to figure out how to grow rosemary outdoors. That's a zone six. So <laughs> haven't managed that yet. Okay. Um, these are some Cheyenne stats here. And um, I have to tell you that the statistics I found were not ideal to find. I really had to hunt for them. It used to be great that NOAA would have the climate statistics right on their website. They've reorganized and re uh, packaged, I guess is the best way to say that, their data. And now you can't get the raw data printouts. They have some summary statistics, which are a little too general for me. I like to know, I like to see the data. Um, so I went digging for you guys and found, found this. So in 2022, our average wind speed was 11.9 miles per hour. The highest wind speed, straight line winds was 58 gusts to 79. I'll bet you the Weather Channel didn't cover the hurricane we had. <laughs> I'm betting you. Usually the wind direction was out of the northwest, which is pretty typical. Um, precipitation, our average is 15.4, 15.6, about 15 and a half inches. Last year it was 9.5. Okay, that's 2022. That's not the water year. Water years are from October around, not the calendar year, okay? Um, average number of sunny days we have here in Cheyenne is 225, which means pretty much two thirds of the days are sunny. Um, we had 271 in 2022, might be because we didn't get as many hailstorms, rainstorms, that sort of thing. Uh, average of 24 days a year, are cloudy, that's only 7%, so we're pretty sunny. Um, we had 26 days that were cloudy in 2022. We had an average relative humidity of 50%. And um, now this is one of the pieces of data I wasn't able to locate. So the last time I was able to locate these statistics for severe storms was a paper that was published in 2014. Um, in that paper, um, there was an average of 50 days a year where we had a severe storm in Laramie County. We have more than th three times as many damaging hail storms as any other county in Wyoming. Number one for hail, Wyoming. And uh, we also have more tornadoes associated with those same severe storms than any other county in Wyoming. Um, we are, last time I checked, not the hail capital of the world, which we kind of feel like when it's hailing, um, but I think someplace in Texas has that um, position. Anyway, I typically get about two damaging hailstorms at my house every year. I don't know about where you live. The last couple of years we've been lucky and haven't had damaging hail. So I've been like, <laughs> Crossing my fingers. Okay, here's some other really important data for us. Anytime you're going to be growing annuals, got to know these dates. Um, so these are usually expressed as probabilities 90, 50, 10. Okay. Um, we are 90% sure that we'll have at least 116 days of growing season, frost free days. 50% sure, in other words, this is the average, would be 137 days frost-free. And then every once in a while, so there's a 10% chance we might have a growing season as long as 158 days. I have contrasted that with Jackson, which has 12, 36, 36 days frost-free is their average per year, and 60 days on that. 10% year, they might have a two month long growing season without frost. So yeah, we're actually doing all right here in Cheyenne. Um, okay, so, and then the other thing is you can also do the freeze dates when you could expect your first freeze and your last freeze. 
Here again, it's expressed as a probability. So uh, you have a 10% chance. Um, you, by the time the percent chance that you're going to get a freeze is down to 10, it's May 26th, kind of Memorial Day weekend. So rule of thumb, unless you want to baby your plants that you're setting out in your garden, wait till Memorial Day weekend, okay? If you're going to plant them out early, be ready to get out there, cover them, put them in walls of water, whatever, okay? Um, then our average last frost date, and this is below 32, is uh, May 12th, mid-May. Um, you're going to be working against the odds if you try to plant your garden <laughs> before that, unless it's things that tolerate cold. And then October 8th is typically our last frost free. You know, 90% chance we'll have a 32 degree weather by October 8th. All right, Jackson, we go from July 26th <laughs> to September 1st. <laughs> All right, so here's some real quick definitions. I know this is the kind of dry part of the presentation, so we'll go through this quickly. I'm sure you've already heard these before. Um, a perennial plant, when we start talking about perennials, is a plant that lives for two, two or more years. Um, we want to di differentiate between annuals, biennials, and perennials. So, the word perennial means perennial through the years. Okay, that's the etiology of that word. Um, biennial means two years. So you're looking at a plant that kind of grows vegetatively the first year and then flowers and probably dies after it's finished flowering and setting seed the second year. Okay, so what is a perennial plant? How do we tell? How do we tell? Looking at something out there. Is that a perennial? Is it an annual? How do you tell? So there's some things. Um, certainly, if it takes more than one year to mature, it's not going to be an annual. Okay, then you have to kind of decide whether it's a biennial or a perennial. Um, things like trees, shrubs, those are going to be perennial because they're going to take a lot of time to invest energy into their root structure, into their branches. And that sort of thing. They may even be several years old in case of spruce trees, several decades old before they start to flower. Okay, but if you look at their entire lifespan that you're expecting, okay, so a sp spruce tree might live a couple hundred years, maybe longer. So in that view, if it waits for 20, maybe even 30 years before it starts making spruce cones, then that's okay. It's investing its energy into that long-term survival. So you kind of have to look to see where the plant is putting its energy. Um, perennials will flower and set seed more than once. A biennial, as soon as they set seed, they're gonna be dying, or at least that stalk, that plant part will die. Um, they may reproduce vegetatively. You'll never see an annual plant that reproduces by rhizomes or stolons or layering like with shrubs. If you've ever noticed a shrub branch that gets leans down on the ground and gets covered with mulch and then you try to pull it up and prune it and it's got roots coming out of it. Okay, that's a good indication. Vegetative rep reproduction. In other words, not using seeds. It's a really good way to tell you're working with a perennial. And also, does it have a period of dormancy? All of your lawns are probably dormant right now unless they're somehow warmer than they should be this time of year. <laughs> um, so anything that that's uh, a tree that loses its leaves, it's got a dormant period, that is gonna be a perennial. Okay, annuals are just gonna be dead. They're just dead. Um, all right, and things like trees and shrubs and other perennial plants frequently will have a way to store carbohydrates in their roots. If you look at a tree, all of the biomass that's above ground is supported by a network of roots and underground structures that is equal to or greater than that. So every time you see one of those big old cottonwood trees, how huge they are, or a spruce tree, there's that many roots below the ground. 
So next time you find cottonwood tree roots in your sewer system, you'll understand why. <laughs> There's a lot of roots down there. Okay, and um, they may also form rhizomes, tubers, corms, or bulbs. Okay, that's also, so if, you, if you're looking at the roots of a plant and you see it's got nodules on it that looks like it's storing carbohydrates, that is gonna be a perennial. Okay, so there's three types of perennials. There's the hardy perennials, tender perennials, and short-lived perennials. Just pretty much like what it sounds, hardy perennial is going to be something that, you know, it can take whatever the climate dishes out and it's going to be there. It's not going to have trouble. Um, these are going to be usually plants that are native to that area or that grow in places that have a similar climate. So they're well adapted to being here. Um, in, in Cheyenne, where this is going to be like zones four and below type of plants. So that just kind of gives you an idea what you're looking at there. Tender perennials are those type of perennials that, yes, they are truly perennial, but maybe not here. <laughs> okay. So, for example, people like to grow gladiolas and dahlias, and those are considered tender perennials. They are perennials but you have to lift them and store them in your garage and then replant them the next spring. So you could debate whether or not those are actually perennial here, but a tender perennial means something that you're gonna wanna give a little TLC. Maybe you put a bucket full of leaves over your rose bush, something like that, okay? You might wanna protect it from the wind or from temper, temperature fluctuations that sort of thing to give it just a little bit of more comfort. Okay, and then short-lived perennials. There are quite a lot of perennials that go like mad. They may only live for two, three, four years, but they will flower and seed abundantly and basically kind of wear themselves out. Those plants are usually very readily reseeded by the seed that they're producing. Um, Pentamen and foxglove are, are like this. Blue flax is another one. If you can get a blue flax plant that lasts for longer than three years, you're doing great. Uh, mine usually look gorgeous for two. The third year, they're going like, oh, I'm not doing great, but I'll put up a flower. I'm doing it. I'm still doing it. Uh, but then the next year, they don't come back, but they will have reseeded themselves, hopefully. Okay, some other important definitions let's talk about really quickly. Native plants, I am going to spend a lot of time talking about native plants in this presentation. So I want you to know what the definition of a native plant is. That is a plant that has evolved in or is indigenous to an area. Generally, when we speak about native plants in North America, we're talking about pre-agriculture, okay? When the folks came from Europe, and they brought their seeds and their plants and their plows and their cows, they brought organisms with them. Dandelions, pill bugs, earthworms are not from here. They're all good. I mean, you know, not horrible things, but um, so a naturalized plant, I just mentioned dandelions, naturalized plant is something that is not native. In other words, it didn't begin here, but it is perfectly adapted to growing here, <laughs> like dandelions. There is no way we're going to eradicate dandelions on the North American continent. They're here to stay. Okay, um, same thing with uh, earthworms and pillbugs. Those things are also very naturalized in our environment. A weed. Here's a definition that it depends on exactly who's talking about it. My definition of weed might be different from someone who raises cows or someone who has a truck garden, for example, all right? There's really no botanical definition for this. This is based on basically, is it something I don't want to be there <laughs> and I have to keep taking it out? Um, it's a human controlled setting, such as a field garden or lawn, and it's basically just an unwanted plant. 
So, and then there's one more category here we got to talk about invasive weeds. Okay. These, there is a definition for the invasive weeds. That is basically a naturalized plant. In other words, it's not from here, but it does very well here. And it doesn't have any natural checks or balances to it. So it just basically goes crazy. Um, Outcompetes native species and spreads unchecked. Here's a good example of a plant that I don't think is a weed, but if you have horse corrals or feedlots or something like this, you're going to like, yeah, get this dang thing out of here. This makes, it's called um, <clears throat> Heterotheca villosa or um, hairy goldenaster, I think, or showy goldenaster. Sorry, I, I don't know what the common name is. Um, it makes these pretty little itty bitty tiny sunflower like flowers all season long. It's a cheery, happy go getter that I don't have to water, and the bees and the butterflies love it. It makes a ton of seed, and the birds love it, and the ants love it. The baby plants are pretty easy to pull out. So I don't think it's weed, but if you're trying to control it in a, in a corral or a pasture or something, you might have a different view of that. <laughs> okay, so what about this one? Does anybody recognize what that pretty yellow flower is? Yeah. Okay, well, this is one of the ones that's on our noxious weed list. This is called Dalm Dalmatian toad flax, and it is not supposed to be growing in the capital flower bed. <laughs> they put cinder cinders just a gigantic planter full of cinders thinking we won't have to put any effort into weeding it and look what's growing <laughs> pretty sure the governor didn't uh want to know about that uh but anyway so um a noxious weed is even worse than an invasive weed it's one that has an economic impact to it so in other words if you've got a noxious weed growing at your place it's going to spread prolifically by more than one method. It might do rhizomes. It might do stems or stolons, cuttings. It's going to make a gazillion seeds. And um, it may be unpalatable or poisonous to grazers. So in other words, your cows, your horses, they're either going to mow around it, or if they eat it, it will make them sick. So there's an economic impact there. Um, and then there's very rarely biological controls, because remember, this is a plant that comes from somewhere else, and probably its pests didn't come with it. Um, so, and then it's also sometimes extremely difficult to control. So you talk about integrated pest management. Has she talked about that with you guys yet? Okay, so integrated pest management is, is the, the best solution we have to this type of weed. You have to hit it from all angles and be persistent to get it <laughs> to get rid of it. Okay, um, and then like I said, there's that economic tie in there. It has to reduce the productivity of the land. We say it outcompetes the grass, or it's dangerous for the livestock to eat or be around. Okay, let's look at. Um, I also have to show you this picture because. They, as far as I can tell, lovingly tend this plant. <laughs> Somebody has to inform them <laughs> that it's a noxious weed. <laughs> <laughs> Same species. So this is a very healthy one. It's a very, it's a much older plant than the one I showed you in, in the cinder bed. The cinder bed, I just popped a shovel in there, pulled it out, and it was fine. It didn't come back. This one has roots that probably fill up that entire container. This one probably makes over a half a million seeds a year. Yeah. And they don't know that it's a weed. Okay, so we're gonna kind of jump a little bit. I don't know. I asked Catherine if we could play. At the end, I have a video. It's just a two minute long video. And if we can't play it here, it's in the document of web links. Play it, it's just two minutes and it's from the Montana Extension and they're talking about this particular plant, a Dalmatian toad flax. And they're explaining 
why it's such a problem, how it grows, how it spreads. And he's sitting right next to a big luscious plant like this, the sitting right on the edge of a creek. So guess where that plant's going to be sending its seeds? Mm -hmm. Everywhere that water goes, you're going to have trouble. This particular plant is very usually, usually spread by road graders. You'll drive up and down the interstates between here and the border. Look for it. It was probably planted originally by residual rhizomes or root material that was on the graders when they last graded the, the bar ditch. So yeah, it spreads pretty easily. Okay, here we go. Here's how to find some good plants. Now that we're done talking about weeds and all of that stuff, let's talk about good plants. <clears throat> there are three sources that I will go to again and again and again and again. That's the Perennial Plant Association, and there is the, the link there, All American Selection and Plant Select. So the Perennial Plant Association is just basically the plant of the year. They've done some testing throughout the United States and have selected one, the most promising new perennial plant of the year. Of course, the greenhouse industry is hip to these. And so you'll be sure to be able to find that perennial plant of the year in a greenhouse somewhere. Um, All American selections. Now these, this is a fantastic um, plant testing organization. They started in 1932. And what they do is they test new varieties of annuals and perennials and vegetables, flowers, and, and then they say they have test gardens all over the United States. And then they'll say, these performed well everywhere. Sometimes they'll say, in the South, these performed well. Like if there's a, a different growing type down there, though, they can break it down like that. But that, let me tell you what, if I'm trying to decide between this tomato and this tomato, and one of them says AAS on it with a little circle, their little logo, I will choose the AAS one, okay? So just kind of, if you're if you're ever in a quandary, I don't need 20 varieties of tomatoes. <laughs> Look for the ones that have the AAS on it. And then plant select, that's something that has been started by the Denver Botanic Gardens and the Colorado State University. And what they do is they're working, they've sent botanists out all over the world to places that have climates like ours, okay? So it could be alpine climates. It could be, they get a lot of their plant materials from Turkey and the Asian steppes, but they have a similar climate to ours. And then they bring them home and say, this is a fantastic plant. Can you grow it? In other words, can you propagate it in quantities that are important for greenhouse producers? Does it do well here? And they test it here. And if it does, they can do a plant, they'll, they'll launch it as a plant select. So you can go to their website and you can literally go back, see what their plant select varieties were each year since the 90s. And then you can also search for like trees. I want trees or I want bushes or whatever. Okay, so those are some very good sources of plants. There again, a plant select plant usually will do well here. Not always, sometimes they have some zone fives. So keep your eyes open for that. All right. Also other places to find good plants is uh, the Rocky Mountain Rock Garden Society, at least pre-pandemic. I don't know if they're doing it again. I hope they will be. Lots of cool growers. They've got smaller growers that come and they've got native plants or um, plants that are specialty plants that you usually can't find in a normal greenhouse. You'd have to order them online or something. So definitely check those out. Usually happens about the time of year where the apple trees are in blossom at the Denver Botanic Gardens. So I like to make a day out of it, go to the plant sale, load up my plants, and then we take a walk around and enjoy the, the apple trees. And that's about three weeks before ours bloom. <laughs> <laughs> Two or three weeks. And so you would look them up online at Rocky Mountain Rock Garden Society? Yes. I do have a URL in the web links document that I think I did not actually test it, but it should still be the same. 
Um, also, Laramie County Master Gardeners have a native plant committee. There's crazy people like me that like to talk about native plants. Um, and um, then they have a seed library. Or there's a lot of people like myself that do try to grow a lot of the native plants. So sometimes I have extra. So if you're looking for something for your garden, don't, don't hesitate to ask. Um, be very careful with native plants though. If you're on public land, so Forest Service, BLM, any other public land like that, you cannot collect plant parts. So in other words, seeds, flowers, can't dig one up and bring it home with you unless you have a permit, okay? If you've got a buddy that has a ranch and they've got 400 acres of take whatever you want, well, go to town, okay? Just, just be aware on public land, you may have to get a permit for that. They're usually not very expensive, but uh, that's the way that you know for sure you're not gonna accidentally impact a population that might be threatened or endangered. Where is the seed library? It's located in the Laramie County uh, Library. Okay. Mm -hmm. So designing perennial flower beds. I like plants, but I'm not a great designer. Okay, so I'm just gonna go through the motions of telling you what to do kind of conceptually, but um, I am not a designer. I am the throw the spaghetti against the wall kind of gardener <laughs> to see what works, okay? If, you know, I plant two things together, I'm like, oh gosh, those colors really clash. I'm the, I'll dig it up and move one of the two things somewhere else, okay? <laughs> I, I don't have the gift. Uh, this is Kathy Shreve's front yard though, and she does have the gift. If you ever get a chance to meet Kathy Shreve, she's an excellent uh, landscape designer. <clears throat> okay, for low maintenance beds, which I mentioned before, we really want to, at least I want to hone in on, um, th there's some things you want to think about. Is the plant long-lived? Does it live at least four years or does it at least reseed itself? Okay, I love penstemons. I don't care how long they live. I don't care if they reseed. I'm going to have penstemons. Okay, so there's, there's that. Have your favorites if that's what you want. Um, does it grow strongly but not overwhelm its neighbors? Does it play nicely with its neighbors? Is like what I like to call you. There are some very beautiful plants that tend to get big after a while, and then you're trying to find people to share them with, <laughs> you know, um, or dig them out and get rid of it. Um, is it a generally pest or disease resistant plant? There are some plants that always have trouble with powdery mildew, that always have trouble with aphids. Do you want that in your garden? Maybe not, you know, maybe, however, you just love garden flocks so much that you really don't care if it has pottery milk. Okay. Um, is it something you're going to have to apply pesticides to or apply fertilizers to on a frequent basis? That kind of gets to your comfort level where you are with that. But in general, I try to avoid those type of plants. And then also think about, you know, even if it has a long bloom time, say a couple, two, three weeks, most of the year, it's not going to be in bloom. So what does the plant look like then? You see a lot of people that trim their iris leaves back and make a fan. You don't have to do that, but that's just because they think that the, when the iris leaves start to yellow back, that it looks kind of scraggly. Okay. Um, so look for multiple season interest. I don't know if you can see this here. This is a picture of my um, rock garden in the winter. And um, it was one of those warm, dry days. I thought, well, I'm just going to pop a sprinkler on that rock pick. And so I did. And I forgot and left it on. <laughs> the next morning, it was beautiful. It was all covered with ice. <laughs> but, you know, look for things that have multiple seasons of interest. Does it have a pretty flower and then maybe a pretty fruit? The leaves turn a pretty color in the fall. You know, that sort of thing. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about designing with native species. Unfortunately, I don't have a ton of pictures of native species to share with you tonight. I wish I did. I am short on pictures. I mean, I can find a gazillion pictures online, but they're, you know, I don't want to infringe on copyrights. So I'm kind of limited by what I can take pictures of in my own yard. 
So the first thing we need to ask is what definition of native do we want to use? Okay, I mentioned at the start of the program that we're talking about in North America, we generally think of natives as stuff that was here prior to agricultural expansion. Um, native to here, here, or native, you know, North America here, or Cheyenne particularly. So I'll guarantee you that something that grows here in Cheyenne is slightly genetically different than something that grows up in Chugwater. How different? Probably not much, but there are some people that want, nope, I want to revegetate this area with plants that were here before we disturbed it. So they're out there collecting seeds, collecting plant parts. They're saving it until they finish their home and then they plant the very same things back. That's a lot of work. <laughs> um, am I okay with just saying, hey, uh, I think I want to plant buffalo grass. That's native to here. Um, if it came on a truck from Kansas, am I okay with that? Yeah, probably. <laughs> you know, I mean, it just kind of depends on what your definition of that native is. How closely do you want to define it? Some people refer to native as the Rocky Mountain West. Some people include Arizona in natives, which I kind of have a hard time with. In my mind, when I'm talking about a native, is a plant that I can plant there and not have to give it any additional care, and it does well. That's my definition. Now, whether that genome actually came from um, southern Colorado or southeastern Montana, I'm, I'm not so worried about that. I'm going to look for species that I can grow here without additional input from me. I like my gardens to kind of look gorgeous all on their own. Okay, um, availability can be an issue. The tighter you define native, the harder it's gonna be for you to find your plant material. In other words, if you're okay with, with the concept that, all right, as long as I don't have to put in additional resources, it does fantastically here, Plant select is perfect because they've gone out to different biomes that are like ours and brought those home from Turkey or from the high alpine areas or something like that. Um, that's okay. Um, if you've got a narrower view, then it starts to become, how do you find the plants? Um, but um, seeds and plants um, are possible to find. There's some places that are Basically, you can purchase seeds. They're the type of places you would order seed mixes to revegetate roads or after you disturbed it, putting your home in, um, rec reclaiming land, uh, mine lands and stuff like that. So there's companies that just handle seed and, and plant parts for that. Um, but then also you have to kind of think, well, what's your vision for your garden? Do you want like the tightly manicured, everything is in its place kind of garden. If that's what you want, natives probably aren't gonna be your, your plants, okay? You're not gonna want to have that kind of plant. Um, if you're wanting for the kind of more messy cottage garden, the, the meadow look, then natives work super well in that type of garden, okay? Um, they're also typically bloom for shorter periods of time. Sometimes they can even skip years. If they're not, if they don't have the right growing conditions to bloom that year, they may not. So there again, if you want to make sure you have a purple flower right there year after year after year, maybe a native isn't the thing. Um, natives usually um, uh, have very specific habitat requirements. In other words, they go great if they're on gravelly soil or an incline like this or wedged in between rocks or no water at all. Be careful if you're mixing that type of plant in with other plants that need water once a week. You'll kill your native plants if they don't, if they want less water. So here's some, I don't know how well you guys can see this. I apologize. Um, you guys that are in the room, these pictures are kind of small for you, but case in point, this is what's called a twin bladder pod. It's in the mustard family. And it makes these gloriously bright yellow flowers in the spring. And then they make these really kind of funky looking fat pea pods that turn pink on the outside. 
it likes well-drained soil. Guess what kind of soil I have in my rock garden? Clay. It was dead within a couple of years. Even though I did not add any extra water, the clay soil held enough water that it killed it. It could not survive in that. So that's a plant where it's going to want what it's want. It's adapted to grow really well if it's in the spot it needs to be in, but that might not line up with where I want it. Okay. On the other hand, this lovely purple flower here is uh, an astragalus, I think, and it came in with the, the fill, my topsoil in my backyard. <laughs> and I had a buffalo grass lawn, and so I was going like, that's fantastic. Um, it was a short-lived perennial and it didn't recede, but I sure enjoyed the heck out of it while I was there. Now, any of you ranchers raised on a ranch? That's local weed. <laughs> <laughs> so here again, it's not a weed in my backyard, but if it was in somebody's pasture, it would be a weed. They'd go after it. Okay, here's another thing, bed preparation. We generally have pretty marginal soils here poor if you come from someplace like Ohio or Iowa where you've got that gorgeous black deep soil we have poor soil here if we can say it it's okay it's okay we can say it we have poor soil um usually it's either very clayey or very sandy and usually is very basic in other words very high pH um, in fact, one time I was using that calcium lime rust remover stuff that dissolves hard water stains on things, and they tell you to wear goggles and gloves and stuff when you use it because it's so um, corrosive. I was working on it in my backyard, and I splashed some out of the bucket, and the soil literally fizzed. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Lots of calcium in our soil. And here... This is a picture of um, somebody was um, getting ready to put a sidewalk in, in the avenues. And you can see up towards the top, you can see it's, it's actually kind of a nice dark soil. That's probably had a bluegrass lawn growing in it, trees and shrubs for the like the last 140 years, probably since the 1880s. So it's lovely dark compared to what is in my backyard. Uh, but you can kind of still see a grayish tinge to it, and that's probably some of the calcium in it. Um, and then as you see, as it gets wet, you can change color down here. It's nice. Deep. I wish I had that. Like, do you think they'd notice if I dug their sidewalk foundation a little deeper? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so what we need to do when we're building flower beds is kind of prepare the soil a little bit. Because none of us have, unless you happen to be owning this lovely house in the avenues, um, you're not going to have soil that's this nice. So you're going to have to do a lot of amending. Organic matter is the answer to anything. If your sand is the soil sandy, put organic matter in it. If it's clay, put organic matter in it. That's the answer to everything. Um, I hear a lot of different, very amusing ways to correct the soil. Um, there's a guy that I work with that swears that every time you plant a tree, you should put a pound of nails in with it. Yeah. Because he grew up in Pennsylvania and their soils may very well be iron limited. <laughs> we also very much, very often have high iron soils. So you don't need to waste money on nails to put in with your trees. Um, okay, so then the other thing is, is you want to till or spade down 12 inches, double dig. Um, this is important if you happen to be planting underneath a cottonwood tree. If you don't re remove all those stinking cottonwood roots, you'll have baby cottonwood trees in your flower garden in no time at all. And in fact, I just did one of uh, my flower bed, I think it was six years ago, seven years ago. And I'm going to have to redig the whole thing thing because there's so many tree roots coming in. I've got little trees coming up everywhere. Um, I like its shade, <laughs> I don't like its suckers. Um, but anyway, then this is your chance, if, especially if you're planting perennials, this is your chance. If you're gonna amend the soil, you're gonna put fertilizer in it, do it now. Aspens have suckers as well. Yep, 
Yep. Yeah, that's what we've got in our backyard. Yes. And we have no choice. That's the way we bought the house. Right. So it's like, more down. Yep. Down. Uh -huh. more down. Not fun. Perhaps not coincidentally, they are related. Right. <laughs> they are both in the same family. Okay. All righty. Well, let's look. Okay, so that's kind of basically, if you're doing perennials, you're gonna have limited opportunity to go in there and add amendments. So you need to do it before you plant your plants. Okay, annuals, you can do it anytime you want. Do it once a year. Um, plant spacing. Let's talk about plant spacing for perennials. How many of you have a house where there's a tree within 15 feet of the foundation? Probably a lot of you, right? Okay, unless it's an aspen <laughs> <laughs> or a juniper or something with a small root, you're, you're gonna eventually have an issue with that tree and you're gonna have to choose between the tree or your house. Spruce. Oh! And the thing is like about, oh, I'd say maybe 15 feet tall. It's a huge one. Yeah, so so here's the thing. When you purchase a plant and you go to plant it, pay attention to the label, how big it's gonna get. And then don't crowd the plants because they're gonna get bigger. I mean, it looks like an itty bitty tree now. And it might not be giant before you pass on, but whoever inherits or buys your house is gonna have to choose between cutting a tree down or moving the house. So most people choose the tree, sadly. It's not exactly their place. Yeah, screw them up, you You know, um, so I kind of liken this. To, so here's, I took a picture of this, uh, was a label um, at, at Fort Collins Nursery, Colorado spruce, height 80 to 100 feet, width 25 to 30. Okay. So that means that from the center of that stem, your, your branches are gonna reach at least 15 feet, possibly more if it's really happy. Do you want those branches rubbing against your house, knocking your gutter off, breaking your window in a windstorm? Yeah, you wanna move those a little further away. Um, very, very frequently you see, especially spruce trees, you'll see them planted too close together, I've seen one on a corner and a corner arrangement where they had three spruce trees and about 10 square feet. I'm like, mm -hmm. if you lose any one of those trees, the others, since they've grown together, are going to be deformed and you're going to end up cutting down all three of them or else it's going to look ratty. Um, okay, so think St. Bernard puppy <laughs> when you think about trees, okay? they're gonna grow up and they're gonna be a big dog, okay? All right, here's some other tips and tricks. Select plants that do well with the same type of growing conditions. So in other words, if it's a shady garden, put shady stuff in there. <laughs> you would not think you'd have to mention this, but some people are like, well, I'm not sure where that plant wants to be. Well, there is a thing now called the internet that is just fantastic. <laughs> Literally, if it doesn't come with a tag or you lost the tag or you got it from your neighbor and she says, ah, I don't know, it's some kind of spruce tree. I don't know what kind. You can look stuff up and, and try to figure out what it is or at least a general, okay, so most spruce trees are going to get big. Um, but anyway, like I said, you can look these things up, try to group things by light and water. If you're going to put it on a sprinkler system and it's going to run once a week, not a good place to plant xeric plants, okay? So just think about that. Um, consider the different bloom times to ensure the colors you want. This is where I have real trouble. Okay, so the bloom for the daisies is gonna be here. And then we want this plant to start blooming when they're done. The, that succession, I have trouble with that. So I'm more of the edit as you go gardener. I mentioned before, a plant's not doing well when you plant where you planted it. Oh, maybe it needs more sun um, or maybe it needs more water or less water. So you can move it if it's not thriving where it is. Uh, one pink is fighting with another pink. The Princess Louise poppy is a beautiful pink. 
But if you put it next to a, another pink, you can see that it's kind of a salmon pink and they will fight. <laughs> so you just can have to plant maybe something white or something lime green or something silver in between. And then suddenly they don't bow. But you might need to move one over a little bit or something. Uh, you need a different color. Oh gosh, you know, when I thought this out, there was gonna, there's a dead spot right there. I need to put something with a good bright color in there. Or it's gotten too big for the area you want it. Or you have a gardening pal that has the most coolest plant ever and you just have to bring one of those home and then you're gonna have to find a place to put it. <laughs> My husband says, oh, you only brought seven perennials home this year. That's great. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm gonna have to transplant 15 in order to put <laughs> those seven in. So yeah, always seems to snowball. Mulching is very important here. It may not have been important wherever you came from to start with. I had a lady move in from Texas next door and she said, oh, honey, I'm a gardener and you have got to get rid of that mulch. You've got to limb those trees up. You got to get the air moving through. I'm like, well, actually that's my snow fence. I want the branches down the ground and we need the mulch here because it isn't southern Texas. Okay, so keep that in mind here. We're dry usually. One way to have to minimize how much you water your chokecherry be tree belt or your, um, your raspberries is to mulch so that that moisture stays in the soil. Uh, you can use all sorts of different materials for mulch. I prefer an organic mulch that will eventually break down and add more organic matter to my soil. But you can use um, rocks, you can use carpet, you can use, I'm not, not like I'd recommend that, but I've seen, I've known people that have used carpet for mulch. You can use cardboard, you can use black plastic, you can use newspaper. So there's all sorts of things. Um, so the mulch also will function to keep weeds out of your garden. Um, so if you're looking to do weed control, you need about three to four inches deep. Um, I find at my house that if I don't use the single grind, if I use like a double grind or a smaller particle size, the wind blows us away. <laughs> so if you use single grind, it usually will stay put. Um, rock like pea gravel is really great if you have a rock garden, especially plants that are more xeric and you want to make sure there's lots of drainage around those crowns. That keeps the, the, lowers the potential for any fungal things happening to those little plants. Okay, and also no matter what kind of mulch you do, don't, don't put it around the crown of your plant. You don't want to create a happy environment for fungus around your crown of the plant. Okay, now we get to the fun pictures. All right, let's talk about, I kind of have this laid out like, um, so we got, we're an hour in. Okay, kind of have this laid out to where you've got, um, we go from the spring to the fall. Uh, I, I've seen so many presentations that they say, okay, for dry shade, here you go. For moist shade, here you go. For dry sun, here you go. But then, like I said, I struggle with trying to figure out what to plant when, so I have color throughout the year. So I hope you don't mind, but I organized it that way so that you can kind of see the progression in the seasons, what grows when. Um, also for you on the um, materials that I brought with today, I have a PDF file of all of the plants that we've sold at the plant sale, all the perennials. So I, I, it's, it's a PDF file. It's only 89 pages long. <laughs> so I'll let you peruse that at your leisure. Uh, but if you want to, for example, say, huh, I wonder what type of clematis grows well here, you can look up clematis. It's all in order by genus name in the, on the slides. Don't have pictures on there because otherwise that would be like, you know, 600 pages long. But uh, the descriptions of then, you know, you just copy and paste that into your browser and you should be able to pull up good pictures of it. So that is on the documents list that I'm leaving or the, that I'm leaving with Catherine. 
So hardy naturalizing bulbs are going to be one of the very first things that come up every year. I am eagerly awaiting <laughs> some, some color, okay? Hardy bulbs are going to be the sort of bulbs that naturalize, that um, come back year after year, will even increase. And those are going to be like crocus and daffodils and grape hyacinths, tulips, it's a ton of, of good bulbs. Um, there's even a thing where the emperor tul tulips, if you're into emperor tulips, they're the big tall ones. A lot of times they're bright red. You see them. Um, they actually have a emperor tulip tracker across the United States. So you can see where they're blooming. You know, you put in, okay, they started blooming in Cheyenne. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> but you can you can watch the, the bloom happen across the United States. It's kind of cool. Reticulated iris? Yes. Uh, is that the same as the snow iris? I've not heard of a snow iris, but I'll show you a picture in a second. You can, if you know okay. what a snow iris looks like. Um, Those are more like red ones and not cold. Oh, okay. I haven't no, the, heard of snow I'm iris. I'm talking about general. Yeah, I, I haven't heard of a snow iris, but I've heard of a snow crocus, but not a snow iris. But we'll we'll look. Okay, so generally you plant bulbs the the fall before. So there's a trick to that. You don't want the soil to be warm enough to where they think it's time to start waking up and blooming. So don't plant them before October. And you also can't plant it once it's once the soil's frozen. So you have about like a month where you can plant bulbs, sometime mid-October-ish, to usually right around Thanksgiving. Um, if it's difficult for you to dig the hole, it's probably too late to plant them. <laughs> they need a little bit of time to start forming their roots before the soil freezes. So you have to give them, it's not so much the difficulty in digging the hole, it's to give them a little time to get a start. Um, you want to use really low nitrogen fertilizer with bulbs, usually a 5105. There's a lot of different products you can use. You can kind of use like time release stuff. You can use bone meal and fish meal, but a very strong warning with those type of blood meal, fish meal, bone meal, that sort of stuff. Dogs can smell them. <laughs> they will dig up your bulbs. <laughs> And I have to be one of those people that are kind of super smellers. I can smell bone meal even if it's eight inches down. I don't know how I can do that, but I'm like, oh, that stinks. So I use the uh, the inorganic sources for mine because otherwise I couldn't handle the smell. Um, but you want to use a low fertilizer, and and then if as that crop continues, you know, fertilize them when they're blooming. You can do that. Or like right after they bloom, you want to fertilize them while the leaves are still green so that they can pull that in. Um, you can either plant in trenches or in holes. Um, if you plant in a trench, you realize that if you lose a bunch of your plants, you're going to have a polka dot trench and it's going to look a little weird. So unless you want to go back in and fill back in, I would recommend planting in groups. It's a little less obvious if you lose some that way. Um, you're going to basically water when your flowers are present or starting to develop. And the rest of the time, bulbs are super, super water um, drought resistant, if you will. They don't need water when they're dormant. And in fact, you can kill a bulb if it's too wet while it's dormant. But that's that's my front yard after I got busy and and dug a bunch of bulbs in one summer or one fall. And now I have lost a lot of these. Like I said, the cottonwood trees kind of take you over. <laughs> so I'll have to replant. So, when do you guys normally take a break? I don't want to go too far for you, but I've got about another 10 slides. 7.30. 7.30? We can do it. Okay, so here's your, uh, that's a reticulated iris right there. One of my favorite flowers. It usually blooms right about tax day, mid-April. It'll start poking out. It's- oh, Glory of the Snow. Yeah, and that's called Glory of the Snow with it, that little okay. pink one. I don't know if you guys can see that very well. 
um, they bloom about the same time. And um, they're only this tall. They're so cute. They're about as wide as they are tall. And, but there's a couple different colors, but this, this is, um, I wanna say this is Harmony, I think, but I like the dark blue and I'm a sucker for dark blue, so. Um, and they usually will start poking up their, their um, flower bundles, leaf bundles right about now, you know, early February, in February. And they'll just sit there, just barely peeking out of the soil, but just sit there and wait until it's the right temperature and then they'll go. Okay, here's crocus. These come up about the same time. There's two different kinds of crocus. One's called the snow crocus. And those come up about two weeks earlier than the giant crocus. And you'll notice the background on some of these is grass. I like to interplant my crocus into my lawn. It gives me a really good excuse not to mow my lawn until about mid-June. <laughs> Actually, I would recommend that you use snow crocus if you want to interplant into your lawn, um, because if the grass grows to compete with the crocus leaves, the bulbs won't recharge, and then you'll lose your you'll lose your plants. And it so like they bees as well. They do. Oh, yep, gosh. that's that's a a crocus and one of the first bees coming out, which is why I put it on there. Okay. You know, early bee food. That's a good thing. So daffodils or narcissi are also another good early season plant. These start coming in later in April, about the end of April is about the first that you can see. Some of them, the like the little ones, the tetatets and the, I'm trying to remember some of the other variety names, but there are some that bloom early and they will, they say they're gonna bloom in February. I've never seen it. Um, usually about the end of April is when they come out. And um, then from there, there's a whole different selection. You can choose the early, mid, or late daffodils. Um, in general speaking, the double ones, the big flower double ones will be some of the later ones. And those will kind of finish almost the end of May. So those are kind of a nice, can have a whole spectrum. Most of these are zone three, uh, so very, very hardy. Now here are some tulips. Um, these start again, it's kind of like the daffodils. You can have tulips that come early and tulips that come late. So you just kind of have to say, I want some of each and just th that'll extend your bloom time. Um, these can range from three inches tall, little itty bitty ones, to big 26 inch tall tulips, the big, like the big emperor tulips. So it just kind of depends on what you're looking for there. Um, uh, let me see, these right here, the pale yellow ones, those are sweetheart emperors. And these in the middle are burning heart, I think. And the orange and yellow striped one up in the right hand corner, that was a tulip that my neighbor planted maybe 30 years ago and it's still there and it's beautiful so who knows what that one is it's a keeper that's what it is yeah. um all right so then one of the types of tulips that you look for if you're going to buy tulips you can either decide i don't care if it comes back after three years i'll just plant new ones that's okay um the ones that are gonna naturalize or last longer are gonna be the ones we're gonna go through here. Species tulips like um, Tulipa humilis, the, this one right here, that's called the Eastern Star. Um, then we've got uh, Tulipa cluciana, this one here. That's uh, Cynthia. And then the light yellow one, which is one of my favorite tulips, it, it kind of makes, it's spreading slowly, but it's one of the last ones to bloom. And it's um, either kind of a peachy apricot color to a light yellow. So it really depends on if it's growing in the shade, it's a little darker usually, and really a nice tulip. And then this is, I think just called peppermint stick. I can't remember what kind it is. Okay. So then there's a bunch of other flowers that bloom right around the time that tulips bloom. 
right there you can see a pask flower you guys got to get one if you don't have a pask flower they're fantastic they're fun uh, but we're looking at pask flower primrose basket of gold windflower and veronica are some of the very early blooming ones species that you can have they often like dappled shade they don't want to be um in full sun or else they can grow under trees but once the tree leaves start coming in they're they're ready to be done so they kind of use that sunlight while there's while it's there so here's a grape hyacinth um tough as nails little thing these will spread by seed and they will also spread by little bulbules so if you've ever seen these planted along a the sidewalk they will just kind of whoop spread and make more of themselves and then the seed will wash across the sidewalk and you'll start getting some across on the other side and um if you have deer deer like to eat the flowers <laughs> so you'll have all these pretty leaves <laughs> very few flowers tulips are also a bad idea if you have deer they do like tulips They'll leave your daffodils alone, though, so you can have daffodils. They also like lilies. Oh, yes. Well, so designing gardens around deer is a whole different presentation. <laughs> so I'll tell you that right now. Um, pask flower, um, these things have very furry, fuzzy, soft leaves. They're fun. They'll come up and they'll make this mound of leaves, and then all of a sudden, in May, they'll start sending up these dark purple flowers with these brilliantly gold centers. And they're, they, they bloom for a long period of time, two, three weeks usually. And if you have one that's in more shade, it'll bloom a little later. So I kind of like to have some in full sun and some in shade, and then I get a much longer bloom time on those. Um, and then I don't know if you can see it, but this is a seed head. It looks like a little Dr. Seuss thing. <laughs> it's just so much fun. Um, and they reseed occasionally. If you have different colors of pask flower, they make um, um, a red one, and there's white and pink. There's some with frillier flower petals. Uh, they hybridize viciously. So if you want the purple, only plant the purple. Because <laughs> yeah. they definitely will hybridize, and you'll end up with who knows what. Um, but I kind of believe that if a past flower plants itself, it wants to be in that spot. That's a good spot for it. So I tend to try to leave it. But these are quite long lived. Um, the ones that I planted seven, eight years ago are still going strong. So basket of gold. This is a full sun and it is really beautiful. Like at the end of April right about the time we like to have our plant sale, it's usually blooming, um, which means that I don't have any trouble selling these at the plant sale. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's excellent for rock gardens to kind of drape down over the edge of your wall or around rocks or over a log. I mean, they're really nice. You definitely don't have to worry about babies with this one. It will make babies, a lot of them. It makes a lot of seed. Some people even will go out and shear after the blooms are spent, just go cut them off so they don't reseed. But if you're a crazy person like me and you don't mind digging them up and putting them in a pot and selling them at the plant sale next year, <laughs> there you go. Or you want a whole line of them down your driveway. This is a plant that you can easily scatter that seed and get yourself a, a population established pretty quickly. They're not hard to pull out if you don't want them there though. So that's the other thing. And it has gray green leaves, kind of silvery leaves. So the plant itself is pretty attractive. Here's just a cute little primrose. It blooms about the same time. There's a bunch of different kinds of primroses. Some of them have uh, pink flowers or, you know, so this is the oxlip primrose here. Um, now this is that um, Batali's gem tulip again. Here you can see it's a little more peach colored. And it's blooming very late in May because it's in the shade and the windflowers are out. So that's an anemone. And those spread gradually by rhizomes. Um, good luck keeping it in one spot. Mm -hmm. But if you want it more like a woodland kind of garden area, 
that's a beautiful plant to have. If you want some, I've got lots. <laughs> you can come share. <laughs> okay, um, that's Anemone sylvestris is the name of that one. Veronica's, these are full sun. They're kind of a ground cover. They come every, most of them are blue. Uh, some of them are white with blue, tiny blue stripes on their um, petals. And Turkish Veronica is a really common, popular variety. Um, I've included a picture down below. Years and years ago at the native plant sale, the rock garden sale, I bought, um, it was Veronica thymoides varietia, variety pseudocinaria. Yeah, <laughs> kind of, it says uh, basically it's a woolly leafed Veronica and it likes it dry and it also likes to kind of hang over a rock. Um, so that's kind of a neat one. All right, let's talk about, you know, we've moved through April and May, now we're into June. Let's talk about some plants that grow well in the shade. Um, they usually can take morning or evening sun. It's the hot sun in the middle of the day that if you if you have a shade plant, you have to protect it from that hot sun in the middle of the day. Um, usually they want to bloom. Most of the shade perennials want to bloom in May into June, so early summer in June. And um, you kind of have to mix it up then with, with different textures, with different leaf colors, because you're going to be, most of the growing season is not going to have flowers to enjoy in a shade garden. Now, there are some things that bloom in the fall again, but they're hard to find for shade. Fall blooming shade is hard. Um, so bleeding hearts, Jacob's Ladder, Columbines, Cranes Bills, Hostas, and Ferns are kind of the staples of your um, shade garden. Uh, these are some of the bleeding hearts. I have these on the north side of my house, right where the hail can get them. <laughs> so far, they've been tough enough to come back year after year, even if they've been turned to, you know, coleslaw occasionally. This is the, the Valentine, so it's a darker red flower and the, the leaves even kind of have a darker red tinge to them. This is the gold heart, beautiful chartreuse colored leaves and a, a lighter pink flower. And then this is the, just the good old fashioned bleeding heart. Now those bleeding hearts can usually get to be you know, two or three feet tall and wide if they're happy. Mine, mine keep getting challenged by hail, so I don't know if mine will get that big. Uh, columbines. This is another one that's going to reseed prolifically. The individual plants don't grow. They're, this is a short-lived perennial, but they reseed themselves. And they also like to hybridize amongst each other. So if you have a yellow one and a purple one, then pretty soon you'll have who knows how many different colors, which is kind of part of the fun. This one down here that's got the yellow center and the really deep maroon around the edge, that's a cross-pollination beauty. And it only lived like two, three years, but I was hoping it would make more of itself and it didn't. Uh, but anyway, so uh, the, this is the Remembrance Columbine or just the Colorado Alpine Columbine. Um, this is kind of an interesting one, the one on the far right there, that's called the William Guinness. And it's kind of a more compact, almost ball-shaped flower. So all sorts of different options for columbines. There again, if it plants itself, I'm, I'm tempted to leave it there because it's happy there. Jacob's Ladders. These are really pretty plants, very soft textured. Uh, one of the most popular ones in the greenhouse industry is Brie de Anjou. I don't speak French, so that may not be correct, uh, but it has a variegated leaf. So that's a really pretty plant, even when it's not in bloom. And um, the there are, the Jacob's Ladders is a native species. So it also can do quite well. It does recede a little bit, not much. If you get a high concentration of Jacob's Ladders together when they're blooming, 
Some people say they smell like a skunk. Right. Um, so you might want to rethink the putting an entire bed right below your bedroom window. <laughs> yeah, just think about that. Maybe it doesn't bother you. It, it smells faintly like a skunk. Like a skunk walking by two houses away kind of smell. Okay. Actually help in keeping maybe pests like rabbits <laughs> away. I doubt it. I doubt it. It's only when they're in bloom. Okay. So a couple ground cover type plants that, that work really well for moist shade are um Brunera here on the right. And um that I think that variety is Jack Frost. But it, it's it's just a really pretty silvery kind of green leaf with the darker green veins in it. It's just very pretty. And it has these airy wispy flowers, light blue flowers, kind of cornflower blue. Um, the Virginia is also one of its other names is pig squeak. Don't ask me why. <laughs> the leaves are kind of fleshy. And when you drag your thumb across it, it makes kind of kind of sound. Maybe somebody thought that sounded like a pig squeak. I don't know. But they turn this really lovely color in fall, this really nice deep burgundy red color. And then they've got, usually most of them have a, a pink or a hot pink flower, which is a really nice flower. Okay, so now we're kind of moving out into the sun a little bit. Geraniums. Yes, these are natives. Okay. So the geranium in a pot on your porch in the summertime originally started out as one of these plants. And then it's been bred to have bigger flowers. So um, there's a couple different kinds of geraniums when you're looking at geraniums. Uh, there is kind of the mound forming one. And they usually kind of just mound up and stay in the same spot. They don't really spread. So if you want a geranium right there, that's the kind you want to get. If you want one that will gradually spread by rhizomes or it might move to a spot where it's more comfortable, then you're going to want to get one of the ones that spreads through rhizomes. And those are usually have um, geranium macrophyllum in their heritage. So that's, so kind of look for that. You'll, you'll look on the tag and if it says spreading, you'll know that that's going to be something that's going to make a larger and larger patch. Um, this. Um, this one here in the middle, it's got a really nice hot pink flower and it is called Mavis Simpson is the variety. Um, and, and geraniums can usually grow anywhere from full sun to part shade. So they're pretty flexible. So if you have like a basket geranium, can they be overwintered in a garage? Or yes. Okay, so. That was my experiment this year. Yes. <laughs> With a caveat, okay, um, you're going to have to do work. It's going to basically have to put out a set of leaves to grow in low light. And then it'll have to set out a new set of leaves to grow in full sun. So be nice to your geranium when you set it back out is gradually introduce it to the sun. Yes. It yeah, otherwise it will die because you'll shock it. <laughs> Question? I cut mine way back and overwinter them in the house. Yep. I just I yep. have in the guest room. I have a big shelf in front of the window. Yep. And you know, I've chosen to do that this year. So I'm like, well, you're going to the garage, you live or die. <laughs> they, get, they get so big. Yeah. So yeah. I haven't had any problems cutting them, you know, cutting them down pretty short. And so this is probably there. one of the greatest coups that the greenhouse industry ever did was to convince people that geraniums are annuals. Oh. Begonias are animals. What the hell, Jesus? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> really. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> um, that being said, I have found that when I bring plants in from outdoors, um, that they can very frequently bring pests in with them. And I have a substantial amount of plants indoors with which I don't want to share those outdoor pests. Um, I tried to bring my rosemary in for years. I had aphids on my rosemary. I had scale on my rosemary. I had spider mites on my rosemary. Who would have thunk it? Who would have thunk that the, the, the rosemary would have these kind of pests? And then it shared it with all my other plants. And I'm like, okay, I'm not doing that anymore. 
Um, so definitely there's all sorts of plants that you can set out like big, the big majestic ferns. They do fine outside during the summertime. You can bring them in and out if that's what you want to do. I just beware of pests and um, introduce them to the outside and to the inside slowly. Okay, now, where were we? We were talking about geraniums. Okay. Um, full sun and this is my rock garden. And when I talk about gardening with natives and it looks like a meadow, that's kind of the vibe I was going for with that garden there. And it worked really, really well. Um, I uh, found out the, the purple flower is Rocky Mountain Penstemon, and it recedes prolifically if it has bare soil. So as my garden matured and I got less and less of the bare soil, I got less and less of my Penstemon, which made me sad. Um, here, the yellow flower in the middle is um, a Missouri Primrose. Fantastic plant. That's another one. You got to have one, at least. Every, every garden should have one. Um, I have seen Rocky Mountain Penstemon growing with prickly pear cactus. So they are extremely drought hardy. Um, yeah, but you could, you, you basically just need to group your plants to kind of the same water regime. What I usually do is during the Penstemon bloom, I'll set a sprinkler out there and that'll sometimes extend the bloom a little bit. Um, and you know, if I, if I look at my garden, I'm like, just looks dry. I'll set a sprinkler on it, but that might be once a month or something. So it's not something that takes a lot of, you know, you'll see people that says, oh, I don't want a flower garden. That takes too much water. I'm going to put rock and nothing else. And three years later, they'll have weeds in their garden. It, it'll be great. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, some perennials can take some shade, but flowering might be reduced. Okay, so keep that in mind that if it says full sun, you're looking for a place where it can get at least six hours of sun a day. And then the, the more shade it has, it may affect its flowering. It might affect its longevity. Just kind of think of that. It might need to be drier, not as wet. So yeah, it can affect a lot of different things. Um, and then this is our, I'm almost... I think I'm actually at my halfway point where we were gonna take a break. So you guys here, if you guys wanna take a real quick break, please do. Um, I apologize for going over, about 10 minutes over. You guys at home, if you wanna take a quick, you guys usually do a 10 minute, is that what you do usually or 15? 15? We'll, we'll start talking about the rest of the June flowers in about 15 minutes. That would be about five to eight. Please, if you guys are up here, I have, I'll take all my goodies out. So this, this is a plant, I don't know what kind of it is. It's a very nice plant. <laughs> It's kind of like that. Yes, like I like it. But the second one I have a home with a long tail, but mine's like that big. This has um the flowers. Was sorry, I'm actually destroyed. It's only flowers seen once. Uh, oh, you're gonna look it up? See, I didn't check that out. I love this app, right? You know, I take no picture of this. Um, <laughs> let me take it. It's a calendar. Is it a different variety? Mm -hmm. It might be close to that. It looks like it's different, but please. Thank you guys, I appreciate it. If everyone wanted to go to the door, I'm going to look at everything. Where's the different variety? There's a little bit of a down in between. Every one of the, every one of the, yes. Yeah, I've seen them. 
So unless you look at it from any of them, maybe that's not at all what the flowers look like, but it's so pretty. Does your stuff like house plants have like a lifespan? Generally not. Mm, so like I, I've had some of them mine a plant for like oh, I used to have like 16 yeah. years or something. Like I saw it and then the one would be the tree <laughs> and it got huge. And lately it's like three plant like I can see stuff like that. It's like <laughs> I had I, we moved two years ago and it's like it doesn't like I don't think it's like an area it's so like, it might have it grows so that's yeah, what house plants is Thanksgiving you might not have it but I just call it they're pretty particular about what like yeah like or you might be watering it more or less with that with the new fire and you'll change the cover so you might hold on to the water more or I think it's yeah, a wonderful little yeah, thing. It's, 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 it's from a really old home so garden 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 for plants. Okay, yeah. But like this too is like um yeah. 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 and then you put a wooden dowel so you plant it in Oh, yeah. oh okay. bottle of thing. Here's the, yeah. here's the here's the tube filling all the soil, I don't, I don't, and then the wooden dowel you take out and look at the dry. Uh, that's a good idea. I I just I make an encounter. I'm killing something here. Like, 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 these are all are. And this my cat, our cats are also made her our four new cats. She was doing on my uh, air plants. They're a lot of fun. They're really good. So you can probably make, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, we can do the four of us. Oh, no, he knows now. Really? So I don't know if you want to. Yeah, that's that. You're welcome to take them. In fact, I'll encourage you to take them. Well, just one little one. Our letter strings is big. Finally, it looks like it's similar to that. You live, you live. Yeah, I'm going to get it. was like the whole, it's like a, it's just no big one. It's on the side of the watch. It's 24 7 all year round. It's too big for me. It's too big for me. It's too big for me. Yeah. I think you have to take uh, some some paper towels from the restaurant and wrap those in there. Or you can you can tell it was tight. Yeah. Oh, so this is a bunch of zip on bags for yeah, I'm not even talking about that. Yes, right. Because I don't need that. Now that you pointed it out, that would be three big plants. Like, no, you don't need to do that. You can start running the pumps. I'm up on a chair. Can you just pass? You know, we died. So, so that so well. Those are the entirely. so that there's drainage, but on those will ruin. But I don't know right now where to get it because your quick sale is not for the whatever. Oh, we've got a sale. We can see we can check. Okay, we have some stuff there. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's like that's for lucky, but okay. Oh, I have no idea. That's what I would need to have. Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. oh, yeah. 
You can totally just keep them in water. I I they are pretty much um kind of they range depending on where they are growing they range from pink real pretty hot pink to salmon mm -hmm. so those mean they like bright and red like so if you wanted to have a nice, say, 10 inch, okay, pot, cool. take about that. Are you going to move on? Who some other group? I will. Okay. Who wants the other one? Sure. I have to move on. All right. I have a fish can with plants, but it's not doing it. Oh, well, maybe we can talk about that. Uh, oh, uh, I think but I know why. Yeah. Unfortunately, okay, I got some more. Unfortunately, um, the tips yeah. of the leaves that don't get munched. These guys, oh, wow. these guys absolutely do not like cold weather. Okay. You'll have to put it in your coat. Yeah, put it in soil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it? Yep. <laughs> you, you can put it in the glass water too. Yep. So don't believe the name Christmas cactus. Yeah, I put it in with my fish one. Yeah. Yeah. Like it once. Not at Christmas. I don't know. That. <laughs> <laughs> it's been wrong with your fish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's just digging right in. Uh, uh, this, one, this one is a hard thing. So it ends when it makes a nice, really nice plant. And you just got an almost complete fill now. They're, they're tough. They, they're they don't tough. like to dry out a lot. Yeah. It's way up on the shelf because we need that much light. It's fairly good. And I've noticed you water that up. It's like, what are you talking about? No, it was up there. <laughs> the other plants are all where you can see it's them. Patron. I don't know if I don't know if I don't know if she wants to do much of it back. It's gorgeous. Yeah. 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 Help yourself, plants. So this one, I'm going to take them home. This one will make a nice pot. This one gets like the money. I'm going to talk to my little neighbor kid because he likes plants. I want to keep plants. So this one's going to It makes kind of a nice little mound. But we'll also start to shoot with murder me. I think it's murder me. I've got one of these in there. I know that he could just do with that because it's so forgiving. It's a pretty plant. I've had that plant. 25 years. It's similar to this one. You can take the whole thing. Well, this, here, what you should do is you take this thing out. This is fine. I'll talk to this part. 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 i don't <laughs> And then how far down do I plant like this? So we'll make roots. So what I would do is I plant it down, you know, to just above one of these okay things. Okay. And they're they're not despite the name, they're not growing. 
Okay, well, thank you guys. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. I think it's almost time to get started again. You need one for your office. These would do well in office setting. Okay. All right. So you guys that are at home, you missed this really fun, like Catherine thrusting plants into everybody's hands <laughs> session. <laughs> and, uh, we'll we'll kind of go over as we go. The, the, the house plants are kind of at the end. So we'll go over in particular what growing conditions work for these plants so you know how to take care of them. Um, but if you kill them, I have more. <laughs> so don't worry about it. Okay, so we were talking about the flowers that like to bloom in June in full sun. Um, this is one of my all time favorite plants. I've already stated that everyone needs to have one of these. They are so cool. They form a tap root and don't need any extra water. And they start blooming usually around the end of May, first part of June, right about the time that the penstemons bloom. And they have a big bloom in June. And then they kind of will have a sporadic flower that comes out now and again, clear through the frost. And it, they're, they're like four inches across, bright yellow flowers. Some of the cultivars, so now this is the native species, Missouri primrose. Um, but 
there are lots of cultivars that they've built where the leaves are maybe, they call it like silver blade or lemon drop or anything, you know, like the, the flower is slightly different yellow or the leaves are a different shape or color. Um, so there's all sorts of those. They're all still same species usually, um, but uh, they've been bred to highlight certain characteristics. Now, so here's your, um, here's a lemon drop. And if you're looking compared to this, the native species, you see how the leaves are more linear compared to this here. So that's just slight differences in the leaf shape. Flower cover, color is more lemon than the bright sunshine yellow. But this is the seed pod down here. This is the other reason that this plant is so dang cool. And what I do is I just leave the seed pods on the plant all winter long. They're out there buried underneath the snowdrift right now. And when it melts off in the spring and I do my spring cleaning for my, my rock garden, um, that's gonna be kind of a long, here's a here too. Oh, okay. Um, that's going to be, I'll, I'll take all the dead stems away from that and you'll start to see the new shoots and stems coming up. And um, at that time I pick up the pods, they've already split open and they look like another little flower. So if you're into, you know, dried floral arrangements, that's a pretty cool thing. But if you want to pull the seeds out of them, get yourself a sheet pan or something, and gently pry those pieces apart and the seeds are just all along the middle. And you can, what I usually do is I go out and I go like that. And the ones that germinate are where they wanna be. So they will want um, probably bare soil to germinate like a lot of native plants. Very cool. If you want one, come get some seed pods. <laughs> um, Okay, uh, low water, some of the other things we look at are the sedums or stone crops. There are a lot of native stone crops. They usually grow like in gravelly places, in between rocks, um, out in places where there's literally no shelter for them. So they're, they can take some real exposure in the native environment. So stone crops like this yellow flowered one right here, that's an oak leaf stone crop. Really tough plants. These have been um, probably bred from the native plants, but they still retain a lot of those very hardy native type qualities. Um, right there with it here in this tiny little plant is just like a baby dianthus. It's called a trough dianthus, and I bought it at the Rocky Mountain Rock Garden plant show. It is now about this big, about 14 inches across, and it's mounded up like this. <laughs> um, other than I have trouble with it winter killing on the south facing portion of that bun, when it blooms, it's covered with these itty bitty tiny little quarter inch wide pink flowers. It's just the neatest thing but it's all on one root. I can't divide it because I've had so many people say, can I have a piece of that? I'm like, I don't think we can transplant that one. So um, then also phlox, this is a creepy phlox right here. I like that hot pink in contrast with, this is a dragon's blood sedum down in the corner. That's just kind of a neat, I like contrasts in my garden. Those would make a good like brown cover. Yes. So the creeping flocks bloom kind of in the end of May through mid-June kind of time frame. It usually comes in blues and purples, the hot pinks, are, and sometimes they're striped. But those, yeah, those would make a nice ground cover. And they are a very long-lived perennial. Yeah. Okay. So here's some Rocky Mountain Penstemon. I mentioned that I had buffalo grass in my backyard. When I built my housing, when I built the addition on my house, it gave too much shade to the yard for the buffalo grass to be happy, but it created a lot of bare soil for my penstemon to be happy. <laughs> so we literally had half of our yard was Rocky Mountain penstemon. <laughs> my husband hated it. I loved it. 
And this is why, because the butterflies would just come and the bumblebees and the native bumblebees and honeybees. And it was just a bonanza for the pollinators. So I, I loved it. Uh, we did eventually have to sadly replace our buffalo grass lawn with bluegrass lawn <laughs> because <laughs> I was spending three or four weekends a year keeping the weeds out and I wanted to do more other things with my time. So these are semi evergreen during the winter, um, especially if the leaves are protected like with um, wind blown leaves or something like that, they will turn this really deep dark burgundy. So what happens is the chlorophyll A dies, but the anthocyanins in it, which is a form of chlorophyll, still is alive. And it will still photosynthesize throughout the year if it's not frozen solid. Um, but what this does is it will kind of die down these big thick stems. It might die down to here, but then the plant will send up new or branch off of the uh, lower ones and very nice plant. It's not, like I say, it's a little bit more free form. Wouldn't maybe fit in a cottage or a very formal garden, but it's great for if you've got bare soil in your yard or your something, you can plant those. All right, cat mints are really nice for pollinators year round. They pretty much make flowers all season. Um, cat mints are not catnips. Okay, there is a difference. <laughs> you plant catnip, you better have a way to contain it. And you better shave the seeds off before they form. And because otherwise, even if you have it in a galvanized bucket on your front porch, the seeds will go everywhere. So you, you kind of have to plan ahead if you plant anything in the mint family. These are quite well behaved. They don't spread a lot, they spread some. I find that if you pull the seedlings up, they're not hard to control. But the bees love these plants all summer long. Cats still love them. Yeah, yeah, they don't get as stoned. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that one has the regarding yeah. to go in and like right on top of it. Right <laughs> it. Okay. Oh, goodness. Another one that I like that's really big on a show when it's in full bloom is the soap work. This is another one, however, that if you don't want lots of it, shave the blooms off. You know, when the blooms are spent, shave those, shave those seed pods off. Um, but it'll, it's a great one for like rock gardens, draping over rocks or logs or that sort of thing. Um, next to it, you'll also see what's called snow in the summer. And that's a really nice, pretty plant, but it's going to be a little aggressive with spreading. Now, it's also really easy to control. Just grab some, rip it out, toss it in the green bin or whatever. Um, so if you want it to stay kind of polite, you're just going to have to keep trimming it, okay? But it is nice. It blooms about the same time. White flowers and then the leaves are kind of a silver. <laughs> Here's, we're talking about the creeping phlox here. Uh, hot pink, they come in like emerald blue, emerald pink uh, is a pretty common one. I like um, what's called the Lemhi purple. It's a, a cultivar, it's a little more drought tolerant. And um, those are, so the creeping flocks make great ground covers. Also shown here is an Iberus or a candy tuft. And there's a gazillion different kinds of candy tufts, but they're all basically, you know, a really nice deep green leaf. And then early summer, they have that nice bright white flower. You usually get, what, six to 18 inches tall, depending on the variety they kind of mound up, they don't spread. All right, poppies. Poppies are tough. They are very tough for me to grow in my yard because I have really heavy clay soil and they don't like it that wet. So I, I, I struggle with poppies, but if, if they're happy at your house, I'm envious of you. Um, that's picture. We've got the Princess Louise there, that salmon-y pink color I was talking about before. Um, and then I'm not sure what the, that might be an Icelandic poppy there, that, that one down below. But, and 
then that orange, that double orange one is one that my mom grows. It's probably, the plant itself is probably 60 years old. I have no idea where she got it. Um, but it's very happy where it's growing. <laughs> she in China. <laughs> it's in Lander, which is true and properly zoned for. Um, I have those growing up and I I could try to see if I could get some seed pods for you, but um, usually I'm not there at the right time of year to get them because uh, once they open, <laughs> they're gone. Um, but I can try. Um, usually poppies range from red to white, orange, that kind of co color palette. All right, asters and flea beans. This is kind of a staple of the early summer garden. Think. Montane meadows, if you will. You know, these are kind of the plants that like to grow. They're usually blue to purple, sometimes white, but most of them are kind of in the purple family. La, la, la. <laughs> Lavender, lilac. <laughs> la, la, la. <laughs> Got a question? My asters don't tend to bloom until late, late, late. Like they're one of the plants that go last from mm, September until it freezes. Mm -hmm. So that's probably what they call a New England aster. As New England asters, I also have yeah. purple one. The New England purple dome. The, the New England aster that I have is white with yellow, and yeah. then I have another one that's purple. They so they're just a slightly different type of aster you know so um there are lots of asters and then there's asters that we call asters that they're really not asters but they're they look like them so yeah that's kind of flea banes are also another um one typically those are the earlier blooming so you'll see you'll see depending on the species that they'll bloom at different times so that's certainly something that if you really like these little kind of flowers you can kind of one want one that blooms early, the one in the middle, and yeah, definitely. Well, I like them that they're that I have something blooming that late. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And we'll talk about some of those when we get to that part of the year. Um, so it seems like there's no shortage of things that are going gangbusters in June. So the next couple of slides are those type of plants. The irises, um, definitely we've got um on, on the, this side, left-hand side. That is a Siberian iris. Those are very hardy here, um, as you might guess from the name. Um, these, these are called German iris, and they're usually the um, bearded iris or German iris is, is the typical iris that you see. These can come in tall, medium, short, some of them are only dwarf irises. There's some that have reblooms. So there's quite a wide variety of irises. There's probably every color under the sun. And um, literally you could take acres and acres and have a collection of them if that's what you're into. This is the native iris or one of the native irises. It's called blue flag. Um, here again, that's something that when it's in my rock garden, I love it. If it's in your hay pasture, you hate it because it's poisonous to livestock. So, um, you know, just one of those sort of things. What about pets? Um, pets don't mess with them usually. Uh, the the probably they'd have to eat the rhizome, the the root, and they they just don't taste good. I don't. I've never heard of a dog eating them. But then again, dogs will eat god awful <laughs> crazy things, right? So dogs eat things you don't. Yeah, <laughs> but usually there's some other crazy thing that doesn't take so much work to dig up and eat. <laughs> so are the flowers the easiest way to identify the variety of iris they have? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, um, the, they they the the leaves the growth form. Um, the Siberian iris has really slender, long, grass-like leaves. The plant gets like yay tall. Um, the, the bearded iris, they have the, the wider leaves that are really thin. Standard gray-green color. 
And then the, the blue flag iris, that's kind of a, also kind of a, a grayish color, but a bluer color. But yeah, I mean, you can tell. I mean, you look out in a meadow, a wet meadow, and there's all those little irisy things growing out there. That's going to be a native iris. I think we have Asian iris as a closing circle. So, we add some back in Decatur. Maybe, but they all kind of grow that way. So they all use rhizomes to grow. Right. And they grow, if you if you picture a ginger root, if you've never seen an iris root, it looks a lot like ginger, okay? Yep. And they kind of just grow, they start with one chunk and then they grow a little nodule off this way and a little nodule off that way. And so they do kind of just spread they do spread in a direction. Just close. Yeah. We had so whatever ones that we got in my front of the garden and it grew in our front of the garden. Okay. I don't think Asian iris grow very well here. Probably so. not. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe where you came from, but not, not here. Okay. Uh, the next big, huge, 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 huge family of plants is the daylilies. Just like iris, you can find any color under the sun. You can find rebloomers. You can find scented, non-scented. Um, all of them are favorites of deer. So if you have deer plant iris, <laughs> or put it inside a cage. Okay, delphiniums. Here's another. This is kind of more... A more typical cottage gardening, if you will. Uh, these usually are taller. They do have some shorter delphiniums, but most of them are, you know, three to six foot tall, five foot tall. So keep in mind with the wind that we can have here, you might want to stake them or locate your delphiniums where they are a little bit protected from that wind. Um, if you stake them, stake them before they send up their spikes, because once they send up their spikes, trying to catch it in a stake or a twisty tie or something, you'll, you'll have a time of it because they can break off. The nice thing about delphiniums is if you have a hailstorm in spring and they get smithereened, they'll usually come back and you'll have a fall bloom. So I mean, my neighbor, elderly neighbor lady, she says, Kim, my delphiniums. They're, they're blooming in September. Why are they blooming? I said, well, because we had that late freeze. And they just, this is how long it took them to get up and going again. Can you go back on the screen? Oh, sure. You bet. The daylilies? Yeah. Now, the more, the closer you get to the urtypical daylily, the old-fashioned daylily, the more they're going to spread. The more hybridized ones, the ones with frilly edges, the ones that have scents, the ones that have special colors, that sort of thing, those are likely going to be pretty polite in a garden. If you have the old fashioned type, like this um, orange narrow leafed one right here, they will spread and spread and spread and spread. So if you want a whole line of them down your driveway, you want to choose one of those that's going to be a more aggressive spreader, like, a, like the old fashioned kind. Our house didn't have been too. They're so thrown up these. I was like, it kind of looks like my lilies. I'm gonna leave them alone a little bit. And they grew probably like five feet tall and they finally bloomed and I was a lily. I'm like, how are you so tall? <laughs> so lilies can do that too. Um I don't have any lilies at my house. Um, but I'm trying to find a way to put some in. So some of the oriental lilies. Once I have a variety of things to have, maybe that's why they're so happy. Maybe, they yeah. They're in the house and they're on the south side, so. Maybe they have a little warmer. Um, so I did toss in some things about, most of these are not shrubs and vines, but you can't really talk about perennials in summertime without talking about roses. So I threw a little bit in here about roses. Um, just very briefly, they are the kind of thing that can usually, they bloom in June, but there's lots of roses now that have repeat blooms. Um, and so can even some that are called continuous bloomers. So you can find roses really throughout the growing season in Cheyenne. Um, 
They come in miniature roses, tea roses, shrub roses, climbing roses, all sorts of different growth types. Um, do yourself a favor and buy on their own root roses, okay? Probably the best place to find own root roses is high country roses. They have a really nice website where you can sort for like say zone four. I want a zone four climbing red rose and it'll pop up, boink. Um, they'll send you this itty bitty tiny plant. Don't panic <laughs> yeah. because it's on its own root and it will likely survive much better than a grafted one. Um, like I just put in one last year, it was called, um, what was it? Oh my gosh, I'm not gonna remember the variety. I'm blanking on it. But I saw the High Crunchy Roses sold me a little one for $15. And when I went to the nurseries in Fort Collins to see what the flower looked like and smelled like, which is a good idea. If you don't know for sure what a medium scented rose smells like or a spicy scented rose, I'm ignorant in that category. So I'm going like, I'm going to go see if the nursery has one of those. And sure enough, they did. I was going like, I like the way that smells. I like the color, the shape of the bud. All right. But you look down at the base of it and it's a grafted rose. So the problem with grafted roses is that's the most delicate spot. The most vulnerable spot is that graft. If it freezes, the pretty rose that you thought you had is gone. What will sprout up from the roots is the very sturdy rootstock usually not known for being pretty, polite, or smells good, or who knows what you'll get. They just used it for the rootstock. So if you can purchase the own root roses, they're much hardier. So plug for that. Okay. What is that you didn't have knockout roses right there? Well, or is that root rumors? So this, this is a climb, this is an iceberg, this is a climbing. It's kind of a continuous blooming one. Um, this is the Harrison's yellow. Super tough rose. It wants to form a hedge or a thicket. In fact, it is such a hardy rose that you can drive across the prairie and see where the houses used to be. The house is long gone, but the rose is still there. What's the name of it? Harrison's yellow. And um, so it blooms once, once a year in June. It's magnificent for about a week and a half. It smells pretty, beautiful yellow flowers. And it's done. Notice the thorns. This is a serious predator. <laughs> <laughs> I have mine planted in a stock tank. I cut the bottom out of it. Nice stock tank about the size of this table. It's in the corner. It's contained because otherwise it will continue to grow. It'll come up in the neighbors. It wants to make a, a thicket. Okay. So can have a plan before you plant one of those. <laughs> this is the peace rose. It's a shrub rose. And then this is another series that if you can't get bone root roses, um, the Winnipeg Parks roses are bred in Canada. So they are tougher than most. So I've had really good luck with the Winnipeg Parks series. Don't plant them too close together because you can collect fungal diseases and then that's just bad. Then you have to reach your hand in there and remedy the problem. <laughs> um, so moving on to low water, full sun, um, this is where you're gonna start to see more of the natives. Of course, you know, we, we talked up early on about some of the drawbacks that you can have planting with natives. The, the positive things about natives is that the pollinators need them. They are tough. They're beautiful and resilient. So you don't have to put any extra effort into them. Blanket flower is one of my very, very favorite. It is also the favorite of butterflies and bees. And it, literally, they start blooming midsummer and they just keep going until frost. Um, she's gonna steal my pointer. Okay. okay, another thing that I love, 
Some people call them weeds or milkweed. I have a portion of my garden that is reserved for milkweed. The reason is, is I can sit, I can park myself in front of them in, you know, end of June, July with a camera and just wait for the pollinators to come for me to take pictures. I have so many pictures of bees, bumblebees, native bees, honeybees, monarch butterflies, swallowtail butterflies. That was on my back porch. That's a monarch baby. Robin's ate him. Sorry. Good question. Um, well, I, Kim, what was the question? I'm um, sorry. Yeah, good point. The people that are not local can't probably hear that. So how do you get milk, milkweed seeds to germinate? Um, they take a, a while to germinate. Um, probably best to use cold stratified seed. In other words, seed that's been out or in the refrigerator for two, three weeks. Um, but but then they're going to want, uh, usually, I think they need to be buried shallowly and then just kept a little bit moist, maybe with a little bit of mulch over the top. And then then they'll come up. The first year, they're kind of spindly looking. Yeah. So don't be discouraged with that. That's okay. just the first year's seedling. They're going to look a little fragile. But what's really happening is they're building a nice rhizome underneath the soil. Um, and the second year stock will be like four times the size of the first year. And they reseed like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> this year I got out and cut all of the pods off. off okay. This spring, I probably pulled up a hundred of them. So, so for the folks that are, are um, on online, the, 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 the question is really not how do you start them, but how do you keep them from starting? Um, they do produce seed prolifically and they have those little parachutes on there. So they travel pretty much anywhere where they fetch up against something where the wind blows them in up underneath a leaf mulch or something, they'll germinate. They have a very high germination record, rate you can also transplant them pretty easily if you get them when they're young. Um, put them in a pot, and like I said, they'll look a little meagerly the first year, but then if you plant them out and keep them moist, they're off and running. Um, these are also plants that they're really good to have a plan before you plant your first one. Because if you don't want those rhizomes coming up in a place like on the other side of your sidewalk or something, <laughs> want to put some flashing down in edging to keep them in one spot um, you can easily pull up the stalks um, I have my spot for my milkweed also has delphiniums and some daisies and prairie wine cups and some other things in there I want the milkweed in the middle if they come up with the other stuff I just pull out the stems it doesn't hurt the plant because it's a strong vigorous plant but you can easily edit it. Just be careful. The sap can irritate your skin if you have sensitive skin. So wear gloves, wear long sleeve shirt. Okay. Um, down here in the middle, that little orange one, that's another another native milkweed. Um, I just completely forgot its scientific name. So sorry about that. Um, but that's the orange milkweed. Um, <laughs> tuberosa, Asclepias tuberosa. Okay, it tends to grow out with sagebrush, a drier situation. Um, once they're established, the the showy milkweed, which I have to show here, can grow with no additional water, no trouble. But it's not a mystery once you understand the root network that it puts down. Some people, a lot of people, call this a weed. If you're an agricultural producer, this is a weed. If you want butterflies and pollinator food, that's not a weed. <laughs> and they also smell really good. They smell really fragrant when they're blooming. Oh, the they were just the showy. Just the showy. Yeah, the, the little orange one doesn't have much of a fragrance. Um, this is a native bee on the milkweed. 
So you can see a pollen sac stuck to its hind foot. Um, the, the milkweeds are co-evolved to be pollinated by butterflies. So a butterfly foot will fall in between the parts of the flower and pull out the pollen sacs. Then they'll go to another flower and it'll get stuck in the next one. That's how they co-evolved. That's why it's so important for monarch butterflies to have this plant, okay? Uh, or milkweeds, not just showy. But it appears that the native bees can also sneak in there and get some too. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Coreopsis tick seed. Pretty much anything that looks like a daisy, no matter what color it is, no matter what growth form, is going to be a really, really popular plant. A lot of these are just barely improved from the natives. Now, up here, kind of the top middle picture there, that is um, a native Coreopsis that Catherine took a picture of for me uh, at her ranch. Somehow the sheep didn't eat it. Yeah. <laughs> I leave that stuff alone, actually. Um, yeah. But so so the, the breeders have taken that native plant and then made it. Some of them are taller, some of them bloom later, some of them have different colors. Um, Generally, the closer to the native form, if you're looking to buy a plant, the closer it is to the native form, the more likely it will be to be good for pollinators. Some of the ones that are like doubled and quadrupled um, tetraploid kind of flowers that are rounded up, oftentimes they'll be sterile. They won't produce pollen at all, which means they don't produce nectar. So that means it won't be it's a beautiful flower, but it's not going to work for your pollinators. Okay, mentioned before, prairie wine cups. This is another one of those. If you have a place for this little plant, it is delightful. It kind of just threads its way. It's a taprooted plant, but the each branch is about three foot long, and it'll thread up around amongst anything else, and you'll see these little fuchsia colored flowers just popping up in the and amongst everything else. It really grows nicely with other things. Um, so yarrow is another really popular one. Now the native yarrow is white, kind of rangy looking, and only gets about yay tall. The, the big yarrow plants like this usually come in yellow, red, orange, that sort of color. Uh, have a longer bloom time. Um, these these are a little improved on, but not as rangy. Look, they're they're more of a garden plant that you could put in there. Um, clematis. Here's another thing you really can't talk about plants, perennial plants, without a few vines. Um, clematis are great. Most clematis that you see are probably going to be jackman. This is a Jackman clematis here. And um, I used to not talk about pruning groups with clematis. Or if you're from the British Isles, you might say clematis. So you might hear clematis referred to as clematis in some parts of the United States or in Europe. Um, so there's three different pruning groups. Probably you have no idea what the clematis in your garden which group it is. So the pruning groups are based on what, how old is the wood where the flowers come off, okay? If it always blooms on new wood, that's group three. For my gardens, I'm like, okay, everything's gotta be group three because I don't want it complicated. I just wanna go out there about this time of year, whack them off and they're good. Um, so that if they bloom on new wood, like the jackman does, that's group three. They want to be pruned late winter. So you want to go out and prune it a couple nodes up. Now, they say usually just one, but I'm here to tell you we'll have a spring freeze, we'll have a hailstorm, and having at least two sets of nodes above ground ready for that clematis to grow back from is an advantage. So don't trim them down too low. Is there a certain time that you should start pruning? I mean, like one year, two years, three years out when it's just big? Pretty pretty much just after their first winter, you can go out and prune them. Um, so if you don't know which variety of 
which group you're in, observe it for a year first. Well, you can do one of two things. You can say, well, I'm just going to prune it and see if I get flowers this spring. <laughs> if you don't get flowers, it was one of these other two groups. <laughs> okay. So, and then the reverse is you could just observe it and see whether it's fruiting or is blooming on new wood, what's grown that year. So like a jackman that hasn't been pruned in a while, it'll be 15 foot tall and all the flowers are at the really tip of it. Okay. That's what it'll look like if you don't whack it off. If you want to see the flowers at eye level, whack it off everywhere. <laughs> the other ones are going to grow on last year's wood or from shoots that come off of older stems. So the, those, those usually bloom earlier in the year because they don't have to grow the whole stem. So jackmans bloom later in the season. I think I've got um, group one because it comes up early and it goes around our mailbox post. Um, so, so you want to look at, wood. so all the clematises will start coming up well before it's safe from creases. Um, so they all kind of come up and start growing early. You want to, what you want to look at is when do they flower? So if they're starting to flower in June, end of May, they're probably group one, group two. If they're blooming in July or on frontier days, it's probably a group three. I think it's group one. Yeah. So just look to see when it's blooming. Okay. Um, it's gorgeous. Here's more it. daisies. You know, and if it's doing what it wants to do, you're good with it. You don't have to prune them. So yay. <laughs> You can also just leave your clematis alone and let it yeah, do its thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, summer sun, moderate water, daisies. Here again, this is probably one of the most popular flowers you can find. There are a ton of breeders that are doing a lot of doubling and um, that sort of thing. So this is like um, real sunshine or real glory or something like that. It's one of the more um, genetically improved it's a trademarked plant, it's probably not gonna make seed. I'm just gonna say, they've put thousands of dollars into developing this cold bar. So they're not gonna let that sucker be fertile. <laughs> but usually by the time they get them to the double and the triple, the seeds are infertile anyway. So um, this is a regular Shasta Daisy. It reseeds just fine. <laughs> Let me tell you what. It'll reseed, it'll spread gradually by rhizomes. So this is one of those that you, every once in a while you have to kind of spread it around, share it with your friends, bring it to the plant sale, whatever works. Okay, on the note of kind of daisy-like flowers, these are not daisies, but these are actually called cone flowers or red beckias. And um, these, there are a lot of species that are essentially just barely improved natives, okay? So these are ones that are very hardy here. You can find some that are as tall as I am. You can find some that are little short itty bitties. You can find some without petals at all, some that are green. Most of them are gonna be in the yellow to orange group there. Um, there are also some called like I think those are echinaceas, but um, so here again, if there's double mounded up in the middle or no pollen, those are not gonna be fertile, okay. Okay, um, like I said, the patented varieties are gonna be the ones where they've adjusted the genome sufficiently and might not be fertile. Um, summer sun, moderate water, these are pretty much straight up natives. These are the echinaceas. Um, they're almost always purple or pink. Um, purple cone flowers, so they're native to North America. I've got, and this is Angustifolia here. I think that was Nancy Lomas that gave me that photo from her rock garden. But these are just echinacea purpurea. So if you go to the store and you buy echinacea for colds, that's that one. Um, this is Powell Wildberry. So it's been in, uh, selected to have that bright, bright color, but it's essentially still that same 
species. Summer sun, moderate water. We, you've got, how can it be 20 to nine already? Oh my gosh, you guys, I'm sorry. I'll have them on here by 10. <laughs> um, so this is bee balm. This is, uh, they, there is a native bee balm and it's been improved and selected usually to be bigger, more floriferous, in other words, more flowers. Um, what you want to watch for with bee balm is it can be subject to, to um, powdery mildew. Hummingbirds love these. They'll fight over these plants, though. Fall shade, moderate water. These are anemones. Remember the windflowers we talked about in the spring garden? This is the same genus, but it blooms in the fall. And these are usually slightly larger plants or very much larger. They get big, tall, but they're beautiful pink color. Um, got some Rebecca's in the background there. Here is bee staples. These are um, goldenrods. Okay, these are always going to bloom in the late, later part of the season. Um, they're almost all yellow. Some of them have a more lemony color. Um, but these are definitely uh, fireworks. Um, there's a native in there. So this fireworks is this one here in the lower right hand corner. This is showy goldenrod and this is rigid. So that's a native species up there. Very, very tough plants. Um, here are your fall New England asters. They tend to be large plants. Uh, the purple dome asters is kind of in that group, but they were just literally going to be covered with flowers, usually September-ish. If they're in the shade, they're going to be even later than that. So there again, you can kind of play with that. Um, that's Alma Pochki, the pink. It's also a New England aster. Rabbit brush. I love my rabbit brush. Um, this is one where if it's, if it's growing too big, you can break off a branch. <laughs> it's not delicate. <laughs> you can edit as needed. <laughs> Very good for butterflies and bees in the late season. Um, and the birds also really benefit from these seeds. Leatris, blazing star. It's a, usually it seems like the natives in the fall are red or orange or yellow. This is the rare exception. This is a, a native that's kind of purple in the fall. Oops, more goldenrod. Must have really liked the goldenrod. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about house plants real quick. We've got 15 and a half minutes. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, question in the back. Question. What are sunflowers fall in August? I'm sorry, what was the question again? Sunflowers, where do they fall in August? So, sunflowers are typically, the, the question was, where do sunflowers fall in the whole realm of what we're talking about here? Sunflowers are usually annuals. In fact, I'm not aware of any that aren't. So, they, uh, they're in the sunflower family. But uh, so they're very much related to all the daisy like flowers that we've got there, but they just are, that's an annual plant. So definitely. Any other questions before we move on to house plant? <laughs> okay. Um, so, all sorts of reasons to grow house plants. Mostly it's to bring a little softness and light living things to your indoor space. <laughs> Um, they, there are also a lot of people that tout the air cleaning abilities of your plants. Not sure how many plants you'd need to have to offset <laughs> <laughs> perfumes and fumes and whatever, or cigarette smoke might be in your house. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I like it because it's a nice green color. So most of these originate as a tropical understory plant in a jungle in Southeast Asia. So almost every one of our house plants comes from that kind of climate. So if you think about it, it's going to want room temperature. It's going to want something probably humid on the humid side. Um, and it doesn't need a lot of light because it's an understory plant from a jungle. So it happens to be that those are conditions that 
most house plants do well in the American home. I would have to say probably some of the ones that you grow, that you get from the greenhouse will suffer because your home is not as humid as it wants. It's like spider plants. If you see the ends of the tips dying back, that's because it's not humid enough for them. Got those because my cat was eating it. <laughs> that's, that's a different kind of dying. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, usually you want to water regularly, but you want them to dry out in between. She's told my mouse again. <laughs> Let's talk about watering real quick. Most people kill their house plants because they overwater their plants, not because they underwater their plants. Um, because they like to be moist and regular water does not mean they like to be wet. So my general rule of thumb is water them, say my house once a week works perfectly. If I get them, if I skip a weekend, they're still probably going to be all right. Um, if, if it's constantly wet, you will get one of the world's worst pests called fungus gnats. So if you have fungus gnats, you're overwatering your plants. Okay. Usually the fungus gnats come home with the plant from the nursery. So how you quit having fungus gnats is you let the soil dry out completely in between waterings. That's the easiest way to do it. You can also use, um, you know, fly traps. You can use insecticides. Um, you can use um, bacillus turingensis rinses. Just basically water your plant with that, and it will kill the the maggots. So they're a fly. So their babies are maggots and they eat your plant roots or the fungus that grows in your soil because you've got it wet so often. Okay, do we need to turn my mouse, please? <laughs> Stolen mouse, sorry. I don't know about these instructors that just, I know, I'm gonna steal it again. <laughs> okay, so this is that plant that Catherine took and put in her office. Um, it occasionally, I get it too wet. As dry as I keep it every once in a while, it just, a whole stem will just go. Wah. The stem has lots of nodes on it. There's dry roots, like air roots on each of the nodes. So it's really easy to propagate. You just chop off a piece and let it go. I grossly underwater. underwaters, grossly. <laughs> as in, as in, oh, I think it's dead. <laughs> so, the, the mouse back. The, oops. so the message on the chat, where's the cursor? Was I underwater? Well, I happen to know how much she underwaters. <laughs> it's right up here. Okay. Okay. So here's that Hartley philodendron. It came to me looking really sorry. And now, like I said, I'm sharing with all my friends, same people that aren't even my friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so normally, um, if you have a plant that's sensitive to humidity, like this, the spider plant, some of the ferns, um, the palms, you can use a pea gravel, a tray filled with pea gravel that you just keep some water in. And then as that evaporates, it'll locally increase the humidity there. You could use a humidifier. Yeah, I find that that's a lot of work. Um, so I just choose plants that don't get yellow tips on their leaves. <laughs> so um, fertilizer, I do use a dilute fertilizer on my plants when I, when I grow them, but I don't overdo it. It's very small amount per gallon. Um, and, you know, sometimes if I don't water it with a fertilizer, that's okay. You know, I don't religiously apply it. The thing to remember about fertilizer, it's not bad to use fertilizer. Just apply it when the plant's needing it, when it's growing, it's flowering, that sort of thing. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, so because they're in a closed environment with no way to add more organic matter to that soil, eventually you're going to have to supplement. 
there are soup to nuts fertilizers out there. Um, I use the blue stuff, but you don't have to. You can use a natural organic fertilizer, kind of whatever you want. You use the blue stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> but like I said, I don't overdo it. Yeah. Right. If you overdo it, you basically cause really rapid growth on your plant and it'll be weak and the bugs will find it. They they will it, it'll actually stress the plant that's growing so fast. And the bugs go, ooh, ice cream. No, no, no. <laughs> okay, so the pests you're gonna see indoors are actually can be quite extensive. Fungus is probably one of the biggest ones. Again, control your moisture on your soil. Uh, fungus gnats, spider mites, aphids, thrips, scale, mealy bugs. I've had all of those in my house. Yeah. And some of them are kind of hard to get rid of. So, like I said, if you're going to bring plants in from outdoors in the fall, really spray them off real good with a hose um, before you bring it in. Hopefully, you can knock all the pests off. Um, you can use insecticidal soap, rubbing alcohol, just soap. Um, you can use neem oil, but I personally don't like to share my indoor air with neem oil fumes. So I don't, I tried it once and said, okay, no, can't do that again. Um, propagation, you saw how easy it was to propagate those, those plant cuttings. I probably cut those about Christmas time or right before Christmas. So six to eight weeks in a jar. Some of them have been living in the jar a lot longer than that. <laughs> but as long as you get them planted out, once those roots form, they will form roots from every node, as you can see in your little things there. When you plant those, just kind of arrange them roughly the way you want them in the pot and plant, bury the roots that are planted. If you want another node to make roots, just bury it just above that know that you want to have roots on it. Um, if you have one piece that's too long and sprangly, just whack it off and put it in a glass of water and it'll make more. Okay, um, foliage house plants. I'm not gonna go through all of these. They'll have access to the slides, right? Mm -hmm. So in the interest of time and you guys not going like, ah! um, most indoor plants are not, they're primarily for the foliage. They're not necessarily for the flower. Um, there are some blooming house plants. Christmas cactus is one. Don't get too hung up on mines that reminds an Easter cactus and reminds a Thanksgiving cactus. <laughs> okay, here's the thing. There's about there's several species of Christmas cactus, and then there are other cactuses that bloom differently that resemble Christmas cactus. Um, each one of them is going to have their ideal bloom time. In my house, that occurs about this time of year and about Thanksgiving. These are primarily looking for an uninterrupted stretch of dark. It's the dark that matters to these plants. So that's about when my plants in my house get their dark. Okay, so don't get too hung up on, well, mine's a Christmas cactus, but it blooms at Easter. I don't know what's up with that. <laughs> that's what, well, that's a problem with common names, okay? Um, but they can come in all sorts of colors. Sometimes you can have the very same plant, like cuttings that I gave you, you might take them home and it might be a different color than the plants in my house. because They have different soil, different light, different fertilizer, okay? Christmas cactuses, if you want to trigger a bloom, let it dry out for about three weeks. Oh my God, I was on vacation and I forgot to tell the plants there to water the cactus. Oh my God. Well, no, they won't be. They might be wilty. Water them and about six weeks later, you'll have pretty flowers. <laughs> if they're in that kind of window where their nighttime light requirements are okay. Uh, the one in this corner, is the one that produced all of the flowers, what it looks like. That's the one that we handed out today. I whacked about half of it off in uh, about right after Thanksgiving. So enjoy. Really quickly about orchids. I could do a three hour talk on orchids, okay? I love orchids. 
Um, I have found that many of the ones that like bright indirect light, like Christmas cactus, do really well in my kitchen. Um, my husband likes to tease me and said the only reason we had to add an addition to the house was so you had room for more orchids. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> of course. Um, so the orchids are one of the oldest flowering plant families. Um, it's estimated that they evolved possibly even as far back as 100 million years ago. So it should be no surprise to you that they've been speciating for that long. So there's there are uh, uh, like six to 11% of all seed plants on planet Earth are orchids. So that's pretty cool. Um, they're all, you know, there's about 763 genera. In other words, they're, they're, they've diverged and made lots of different um, genera. There are native orchids. Usually the native orchids will grow in boggy places like Ute Lady's tresses, and they're usually endangered. So if you are lucky enough to come across an orchid when you're out hiking, take lots of pictures and consider yourself very lucky. Please do not disturb or move the plant. <laughs> take pictures. <laughs> Ecotourism. Okay. Um, so it should not surprise you then because of the popularity of orchids. Um, pretty much the growers have convinced people that orchids are, as soon as the flowers are dead, you can't keep them alive and they'll never bloom again. So you might as well just throw it away and buy another one next Mother's Day. <laughs> kind of like the geraniums. It's a coup. Okay. They're, they're very successfully figured out that they can sell you an orchid for 25 bucks a couple times a year. They got you. So I pay 25 bucks or 35 bucks or sometimes even $50 for an orchid, but I keep mine. <laughs> so, and I, I usually can re-bloom them. Um, this is a coconut orchid. It's a really cool little orchid. The flowers are kind of a dark oxblood color, kind of inconspicuous, but literally will fill your house with the smell of coconuts. Wow. If you like coconuts, consider getting one. <laughs> You don't, wouldn't recommend it. Okay, um, here's, uh, so the, the ones you're most likely to see are the Phalaenopsis orchid, which is a moth orchid, that's corsage orchid, or one of the corsage orchids. Um, the lady slipper, like this one, Phragma petalums, those are also kind of a lady slipper shape. Uh, Dendrobium, those are the ones that they make lays out of. And Catlias, the corsage orchid, and the pansy orchid, you see those in grocery stores a lot at the flower counter. They're the ones that look like a big pansy. I can't grow those. They want to be too cold. I can't, I, not, not a good fit for my house. And Oncidium is another one that you really see a lot. But those are the most popular. There's all sorts of other ones out there. But for the typical ones that you're going to see, those are the more common ones. This is a moth orchid. This is one of my favorite orchids. One of my first one is called Firebird. And then um, <clears throat> this is showing how the orchids, they're what they call epiphytes. Most orchids are epiphytes. They grow on something. Mm -hmm. They don't have to have soil. They just need their roots wetted once in a while. And so they basically use their roots to prop themselves up and attach them to whatever they're growing to. So they actually kind of secrete like a, Kind of like a cementy kind of thing. Um, and then, um, so this is an example of a monopodal. In other words, it just grows from one point. It grows up, okay? The, the Phalaenopsis or moth orchids grow up. Catlia orchid like this, you can see that there's a stem at intervals and a node, and then it'll send up another stem and a set of roots, and it grows like that. So that's a symphodial. It can... If it's happy, it'll make two off of one, so it can spread. Um, some of them reproduce using vegetatively by having what's called a kiki, which is a Hawaiian word for baby. Um, and it just, you'll see up on the stem, it'll have whoop, a little baby plant with little roots. My daughter sent me a picture of her yeah. today. Uh -huh. it's got one. <laughs> yeah, so when it gets enough, at least a couple roots on it and, and good leaf, growth on it, you can trim it off the parent plant 
and that's another one. Usually grow slowly. So you might get one or two leaves on a phalaenopsis or a moth orchid a year. Maybe one or two culms on a cattleya orchid. They don't grow fast. Um, on the other hand, why would you put up with this? Hey, my moth orchids, I have one in, one blooming and another four in spike. I will be enjoying those flowers until July. So that's why I keep my orchids <laughs> and re-bloom them. But, got a question? Yeah, can we grow, is it possible to grow vanilla bean orchids? Here? Yes. Inside. So, so the question was, can you grow indoor uh, vanilla bean orchids indoors? Yes. Um, I would have to say though that you really kind of are going to kind of need a like a solarium because they want it a little bit warmer. They're also a massive plant. The flowers usually only open for a day, and in that day you have to make sure they get pollinated. So you kind of have to be invested in that project. But yes, they, they will grow, the vines are like 30 foot long. And so you have to have a warm place, bright sun, and be very attentive to when they do flower, <laughs> if you want to get vanilla. Um, okay, so orchids are actually very easy to grow. They've got the reputation of being very hard. They're really not. They just want what they want. As long as you figure out what they want and give them that, they're quite easy. The American Orchid Society has care sheets for the major genera of, of orchids that you're likely to find. I encourage you to, if you want to investigate orchids, um, start there for good information. And I do also have those links in the link document. Okay. So this is a Neo Mexicali penstemon with a native bumblebee mm -hmm. going all out. <laughs> <laughs> so um i've enjoyed giving you guys this presentation i it did even manage to get done by nine. <laughs> like i said i never am done early <laughs> so um you guys have any questions before we go and we are going to get those slides. uh i've got them you've got them in uh got them in a google drive or we can just save this down to yours whichever you want just save it onto this. Okay. We'll take care of that and she can get you guys the slides. So remember, there's a, a, a Word document with a whole bunch of links in it. There is um, some climate graphs, uh, basically how the year two, 2022 met up with um, the normals and the averages in the long-term climate record. There's record here in Cheyenne going back to 1871. And the normal period I think was 91 to 2008 or something, the 20 year period there. So that's on that drive. And then also there is the 89 page PDF file with all of the things that we've sold at our plant sales, lots of different varieties of different plants. So if you feel like, oh my God, I can't grow my favorite thing from Ohio here, we still have a ton of fantastic plants you can grow. So thank you so much. How many of you guys are going to come help me at the plant sale? Awesome, fantastic. So that's the first weekend in, in May. We're going to, or Mother's, the weekend right before Mother's Day, I think. Mm -hmm. okay. So we'll be sending out emails on that. Also, Kathy Shreve and I will be doing plant propagation.